Good morning. We are calling to order meeting number 275 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, August 15th, 2019 at 11 a.m. at our offices here at 101 Federal Street in Boston. We're going to begin with item two. Um, just to, before we commence, Mr. Grossman, as many um, of you are already aware, the commission required the appointment of an independent monitor as one of several conditions in our written decision regarding WINS suitability review. Soon after the issuance of the decision and order in April, an internal procurement review team was convened in, uh, <clears throat> to conduct a competitive bidding process to identify and select a highly qualified and experienced entity to fulfill this important requirement. Before these presentations get underway, I would like to take a moment to um, commend the procurement team's hard work, diligence, and most of all, collaboration. This was an intense and rigorous process requiring extensive time, expertise, and focus of each member. And I'd like to express my appreciation personally for those efforts to Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you. Uh, Todd Grossman, Deputy General Counsel, Loretta Lilios, uh, Chief Enforcement Counsel and IEB Deputy Director, and Derek Lemon, Chief Financial and Accounting Official. And finally, a special thank you to Agnes Bullio, the Finance and Budget Office Manager and our Chief Procurement Specialist, for being at the table every day, every minute, and behind the scenes to ensure that uh, we comply fully with the public procurement process. So thank you. Thank you to all. And now, um, Mr. Grossman and Ms. Bolio, you please begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Good, morning. Good morning. As the Chair has, has just articulated, uh, and of course you'll recall the Commission's April 30th uh, decision relative to the suitability of Wind Mass LLC did include a condition that required the Commission to appoint an independent monitor at the company's expense and with the company's full cooperation. Generally speaking, uh, the independent monitor is expected to conduct a full review and evaluation of all policies and organizational changes adopted by the company as described in the Commission's decision and as represented uh, by the company to the Commission as part of the Commission's review process. The monitor will then periodically report to the Commission relative to the effectiveness of those policies and the changes. To that end, as was described, a procurement review team internal to the Commission was assembled for the purpose of selecting an independent monitor. A comprehensive procurement process on uh, was conducted and on behalf of the review team, I am pleased to report that the law firm Miller and Chevalier Chartered has been selected as the presumptive successful bidder to be appointed as the monitor. Miller and Chevalier is a Washington DC based law firm with broad experience in monitoring and associated activities. The team will be led by Alejandra Montenegro Almonte. Ms. Almonte and her core team are here today. I don't want to steal their thunder so I won't get too much into their background and experience. I'll leave that uh, for them to describe. But needless to say, as is described in the packet materials, the review team found their experience to be impressive. Um, before we move on to them, I would like to make a, a, a few quick comments about the process that led us here today. You have been provided with a memorandum which is included in the public packet that describes the procurement process. And as the chair has already described uh, in part, the team was made up of the five members uh, uh, including the Chair, Commissioner O'Brien, uh, Mr. Lennon, Ms. Lilios, and myself. Additionally, um, as you mentioned, Agnes Bollier uh, contributed tremendously uh, with her insight and assistance throughout the process. The team reviewed 19 written submissions and scored each based on four categories. They were the experience of the petitioner, the quality and thoroughness of the response, the diversity of the team, and the overall cost. The top five applicants by score were invited to appear and present their proposals to the review team. 
In this regard, we enjoyed an embarrassment of riches of sort, as all of the five bidders were tremendously well suited for this assignment and capable, we knew, of doing exceptional work. There was one, however, that did emerge as the clear choice to us, and that is the group from Miller and Chevalier, which impressed us with the breadth of their direct monitoring experience, their understanding of the purpose of the, this particular monitorship, their handle of the relevant subject matter, the diversity of their team, and their overall disposition. Additionally, though not the highest or the lowest cost relative to the other bidders, the review team concluded that the fiscal terms proposed by Miller and Chevalier were reasonable for the quality of services to be provided. Overall, they stood out as the right choice to implement this important condition of the Commission's April decision. With that, we are here today asking that the Commission ratify the review team selection of Miller and Chevalier and to authorize the execution of a contract so that the monitorship may commence. In addition, I believe it will be helpful for the Commission to identify and discuss uh, the role of a contract manager to help oversee this particular contract. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about the process or anything else. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm happy to turn it over to Ms. Almonte and her team. Uh, no, was there, was there a... I'm sorry. Um, as this process unfolded, uh, was there uh, anything that the procurement team felt that was um, perhaps something of... Um, great importance that was perhaps not contemplated um, at, in, initially or um, was there um, the responses all spoke for themselves and the presentations um, as you mentioned just rose to the occasion? Uh, certainly there were themes that emerged. Um, experience conducting actual monitorships was something uh, we valued. We took a close look at potential conflicts of interest. Um, and any associated type issues and determined that this particular uh, applicant did not have um, any conflicts that were of any concern uh, to us and that they had actual monitoring experience. So those were two of the things that I think we would uh, agree emerged as important factors for us. Thank you. Todd, I, I apologize if I kind of missed your, your ending note um, but as we move forward, if, if ultimately we approve this, uh, this firm, uh, there, is there an opportunity to think about some things in the contract report, you know, relative to reporting requirements and a reporting schedule? You expect those types of details would be worked out with any, with, in the, uh, the scope of contract? I do. The, the form that the contract is, taking at the moment, it has not been executed, though we have been working on it, sure. would be to require them, or who, whoever the successful bidder ends up being, to submit a work plan uh, to the Commission for approval uh, within 30 days of the execution that would articulate um, all of the proposed elements of the monitorship. Some on a higher level than others, not necessarily getting into the weeds on every single thing uh, that's planned. But that would be a way that we could uh, have a clearer understanding of exactly what the plan is. The plan, it is expected, will be consistent with that which has already been described to us in the response to the RFR during the uh, presentation uh, we received, some of the information you'll receive here today. So everything. The basics are already known, but certainly there will be an opportunity to hash out some of the particulars. Okay. And it's important to note, the expectation is that the work plan will be somewhat of a dynamic plan that could certainly evolve uh, during the course of the monitoring uh, activities as things, issues emerge or don't emerge for them. No, it, no, look forward to listening to the um, to the, the members that are here today, but I think the process was laid out very clearly and um, 
articulated every step of the way. So uh, I thank the team for that work. Thank you. Before we dive into, I lived it live, so yes. a lot of work and, and effort did go into it. And I do want to thank uh, Agnes and Todd and, and Derek and Loretta also for the work that went into it, because a fair amount of work went into not only reviewing the submissions, but the callbacks and the presentations and the vetting of the candidates. So. Yeah, I will note that there was a real important diversity within our own procurement team to have the finance, the legal, the IEB, and the commissioner and the chair input. I think it's, it, it was very well put together and, yeah. and, uh, and a great outcome, I suspect. I would also note, I would note that it, it will be a matter of public record uh, that we enjoyed uh, a wealth of riches, not only with respect to our five outstanding applicants that we interviewed, but also a multitude of excellent, excellent uh, responses. Uh, it was very, the, the, the process was robust not because it was difficult in terms of to choose a qualified uh, 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 applicant for your consideration. It was because they were all outstanding in so many ways. So we thank uh, all of those who participated in the process and uh, um, took really to heart the seriousness of this appointment and also uh, recognized what we were trying to achieve in terms of scope and tone. We very much appreciate the responses. Thank you to the broader community. Oh, and, and also that I should add, I think it's noted that the team also participated in, in crafting the procurement and to again ensure that the process followed all of the rules that Agnes knows so well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Boston. Thank you. And I understand that you stayed last evening. We did. We like that the city is showcasing itself well for you with pretty good weather. A little foggy this morning, so hopefully you'll see a little bit of sunshine this afternoon. Escaping a DC summer, so thank you very much. Right. <laughs> So the one thing, that's exactly right, I was in D.C. recently on that, that during that hot spell. Yes. Uh, just remember to please speak uh, uh, into the microphone, don't be shy about that, so that folks uh, are watching can hear you. Thank you. And the green button needs to be pushed to be able to activate the microphone. Great. Fantastic. And introduce yourself the first time you speak, please. Absolutely. Well, good morning. I'm Alejandra Montenegro Almonte, and I, I want to begin by thanking um, the Commission, Madam Chair, Commissioners, for the opportunity to be here today. It truly is an honor for our team and for our firm to be considered, especially amongst what we understand to be remarkable candidates for this process. I also want to thank the Procurement Committee. The process, having gone through it, I have to say was incredibly smooth, um, which we very much appreciated our, our conversation with the committee. and. and look forward to a dynamic conversation with you as well. I would like to begin by having the team introduce themselves. Every person who's here is going to be an integral part of this process, and I do want you to have the benefit of, of hearing from them personally. Nicole? Hi, my name is Nicole Gokjabai. Thank you so much for having us again. Um, I'm the associate on the team, and prior to joining Miller and Chevalier, I worked on very high profile commercial litigation matters in Ireland arising out of the economic crisis at the time. Um, these matters were very much in the public eye and so I have an appreciation and a, a, m many lessons learned as to how to handle those sensitive situations. Um, I've also assisted nightclubs with licensing applications um, in the European side of things. And upon joining Miller and Chevalier, my practice is focused on assisting companies in um, conducting internal investigations. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Catherine Pappas. I've been with Miller and Chevalier for six years. Prior to that, I clerked for two years in DC for one judge at the trial level and one at the appellate. Um, during my time at the firm, I've had the opportunity to work on both criminal and civil litigation matters, but I've focused my work on internal and government investigations. And in that role, I have interviewed employees at all levels of international companies. Um, I have uh, analyze not only witness credibility, but also whether employees have violated company codes of conduct. Because much of our work is compliance focused, I have engaged in root cause analysis and advising clients on steps to take to avoid recurrence. 
And finally, because our work is often very sensitive, I have advised clients on privilege concerns. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here today. My name is Ann Sultan. Um, I began my legal career actually practicing as an attorney in Massachusetts, working on um, general corporate matters, including SEC disclosures and financing. Since joining Miller & Chevalier about six years ago, I have focused on internal investigations and compliance matters. On the investigation side, one of the things that I really love about working at Miller & Chevalier and the way that we approach matters is that we always do it in a very compliance-focused way. So even when we're delving into the weeds of fact patterns, we are looking at root cause analysis, as Catherine said, and also systemic issues that we can help improve at our clients. On the compliance end, I have worked with multinational and local companies on evaluating and assessing their compliance programs, including the ways in which they themselves go on to evaluate and assess their own programs. Good morning. My name is Preston Pugh, and like the rest of my team, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for your time. I'm also happy to be a member of this team. I lead our firm's uh, complex civil litigation practice, and I'm on uh, our firm's executive committee. Uh, I'm a former assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago uh, and have uh, 20 years, a little more than 20 years of employment experience, both on the government side and also the private sector. Uh, I have seven years uh, of combined monitorship experience. Uh, one of them is public uh, EEOC versus YRC, dealing with harassment issues of a variety of types. Lasted for five years and was appointed by the district court. Uh, the second one was with the Waterfront Commission of New York, uh, dealing with some other uh, types of issues. Uh, lastly, i just say that I look forward to serving the public here. So thank you. And again, I'm Alejandra, I'm currently the Vice Chair of the International Department at Miller & Chevalier. Um, like some of my colleagues here, I focus my practice both on compliance and internal investigations. On the compliance side, work with multinational companies of all sizes across a breadth of industries, really doing much of what we're going to be doing here, which is evaluating the structure of a compliance program, the design, the implementation, testing the effectiveness of that compliance program for our companies. We come in both when companies ask us to assess what they have in place and also very often to come in to help design programs from the ground up. And as Anne mentioned, in our internal investigation space, which is the second half of my practice, we really do have a, you know, what, what I consider a bit of a new, unique approach, because it is informed by our compliance baseline. We come in not just to understand individual misconduct, but really understand what went wrong. Was it a design in the compliance program that perhaps was not properly implemented? Um, was it a policy or procedure that perhaps needed to be mod modified for circumstances that hadn't been anticipated? Or was it truly just a, a complete breach of the company's values and expectations? That's what we will be doing here. We understand, of course, there has been alleged misconduct that has given rise to us being um, before you today. We will have that in the backdrop, but more importantly, we're going to be looking at what the compliance structure the company has in place today for its risk profile, its reality, its business reality, and of course, your expectations. Prior to joining uh, Miller & Chevalier, I spent six years in-house. Five of those years was as general counsel to a company operating around the world and across the U.S., including here in Massachusetts, a highly regulated entity. And as general counsel, in conjunction, of course, with the vice president of human resources, I had primary responsibility for enforcing the human resources policies and procedures of our company. In that capacity, I investigated numerous sexual harassment allegations across the organization, across our operations at all levels. I trained on sexual harassment um, policies and procedures, how to mitigate sexual harassment, avoid sexual harassment at the company. I conducted audits of our policies and procedures, again, to ensure that they were fit for purpose and that they were being properly um, implemented. And of course, advised the company um, high-level executives on the reality of, of sexual harassment within our organization. Finally, and probably most relevant, I recently completed um, a role in a monitorship that Miller and Chevalier had. I served as deputy to one of my partners who was monitor in that, in that particular uh, matter. Similar to what we're seeing here, the allegations in that monitorship were at the very high end of the company. Um, it was very high profile. 
And we understood navigating that monitorship that we had multiple stakeholders, but at the end of the day, our role was really to preserve the public trust, not just in the company and the organization, also in the enforcement agency that was overseeing the monitorship, and ultimately um, in, in ensuring that the laws and values, uh, policies and procedures of the company were being upheld. That's the profile that we bring to this project. We treat it with the utmost seriousness. Um, again, we're very honored to be to be here. And I do want to walk you through a little bit of our overall approach. We've talked about our individual experiences, but I want to talk to you, and please interrupt with questions um, as, as they come up, um, of what our approach is generally to compliance programs. We start from the baseline understanding that in order for a compliance program to be effective, it really has to be tailored to the reality of every organization. No two businesses have the same business reality. No two businesses have the same risk profile. So our very first step as monitor is to understand this particular company, to understand its inner workings, its dynamic, its employees, so that we can assess what its actual risk profile is. And from there, we bring an independent and critical eye to the structures that are in place to ensure whether or not the risks that we identify that perhaps the company itself has identified are being properly addressed and mitigated. Um, we also, I think importantly, when we think about compliance, we're not looking at specific elements. We don't come with a checklist. We're not looking at a litany of policies that we want to make sure are in place. We take a very broad approach, and we want to understand how the different parts of the company work together to ensure a culture that is focused on compliance. We want to make sure that the program is embedded so that it's not just the compliance function, it's not just the legal function that is promoting a culture of compliance within the organization, but that it really comes through all aspects of the company. And that's where Preston's experience as a monitor, my experience as a general counsel, we understand what it means to really drive compliance and more importantly, to get buy-in from all stakeholders that the program that is going to be in place when the monitorship ends is going, to, is, is going to survive the term of this monitorship. Um, so that leads a little bit to what the goals of the monitorship are. Um, of course, the goals will be informed as dynamic as our work plan as we continue our discussions with you. Um, but at, at the core is, is to ensure that the policies, the procedures, and the practices, the, gover the corporate structure and governance of the organization are designed, one, to detect when there's any wrongdoing, particularly with respect to sexual harassment, um, to prevent it, and critically to respond to it, right? A program is worth the paper it's written on if it's not something that is actually swiftly implemented when misconduct is detected. Of course, as I've said before, we want to ensure that it is actually mitigating the risks that um, we will be identifying, and that it, it truly protects the welfare of the employees of the organization. That is at the heart when we talk about human resources, that really is what we're talking about, is protecting the, wealth, the welfare, safety, security of employees, its patrons, um, and all involved. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, we talk a lot about internal controls in other com types of compliance programs and other types of investigations, but I think this is something that is important to this project as well. Um, not only internal controls around payments to third parties, payments to employees that are separated from the company, ensuring that those payments are reviewed and approved and authorized within the proper government structure, governance uh, structures of the company, but also, again, ensure that there is a system of internal controls that supports the human resources policies. And what do we mean by that? So taking, for example, alert line calls a sexual harassment call comes in, there has to be an actual system that tracks how that sexual harassment allegation is responded to, is monitored, how it's actioned, and that data must be collected and stored for a program to really be able to be tested for its effectiveness. Those are the sorts of controls that we will be looking at here. How are those incidents reported then and managed, not just by the executive leadership, but by the board itself? because we do believe, and Preston will speak to this, it's you know, not just a tone at the top issue, but it's, it's a conduct at the top. It's what, is, what are the most senior parts of the organization, not just by words, but by action, um, demanding of, of the rest of, of the company. 
We will be looking to ensure that the company has a compliance program that really does not, not just ask, but really promote, affirmatively promote a speak up culture, that it's transparent and really an uncompromised implementation of its policies and procedures so that it's very clear that it's not just some employees that are bound by the values and policies of the employee of the company but all employees regardless of rank within the organization and finally we want to make sure that when the monitor ship ends it survives um, and that's why we will be spending so much time focusing again on the effectiveness of the implementation of this program so that when we leave you have the confidence of knowing that the compliance program that has been reviewed and will continue to develop will survive the monitorship. And all of that, of course, goes to what core goal of ours is to maintain the public trust in the company, in the commission, and in the process that we're hopefully going to be privileged enough to, to walk through. Preston, you want to walk us through the work plan overview? So you get a high level, we won't get too much into the weeds, but a high level overview of, of what we'll be doing if we should be privileged enough to move forward. So, in thinking about what Alejandra said, uh, from your seats, one of the important things to know is that our job, right, as monitors, is to, is to work ourselves out of a job, right? <laughs> All right, to make sure that, uh, as Alejandra said, this program works like it like it's supposed to. It, it, it makes you proud. It makes the the public proud, right? And there's real confidence. There are certain things that we're going to start our process with. One of them, of course, is is working with. Uh, the commission to uh, solidify a work plan, a detailed work plan. We will do that. But some of the larger hallmarks um, include reviewing facts um, underlying uh, the, the decision and order. We've had, obviously, the, uh, uh, the, the pleasure to, to read through the facts uh, that were presented in the RFP package, and we're familiar with that. But of course, there are probably additional things that we need to know, right? So we look forward to having the opportunity to do that. Um, Alejandra talked about the importance of, of uh, the compliance policy and also the structure, right, and, and, and operations of the company and, and, and to what extent do the structure and operations of particularly the human resources function support real enforcement of this compliance uh, program, right, uh, uh, making sure that it is not just a paper program but it's in fact one that is lived. Um, there are some, uh, some themes that uh, we will look for. One of them, as Alejandro mentioned, is high-level commitment. But having done monitorships in the employment space, we know high-level commitment is important. But we also know that uh, the tone from the middle is also critical, right? That it's not just the folks at the top saying, hey, we're going to do the right thing, but your day-to-day -day managers, what are they looking for? Are they making sure that uh, uh, both employees and even uh, uh, third parties, customers, are treating their employees as they're supposed to, right? Or is, is, there, is there harassment that is kind of given a wink nod, as may have happened in, in the past uh, in the industry? We are here to make sure that, does, uh, that the company is doing what it can to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, training and guidance, uh, making sure, and we had the pleasure to speak with you before about this, but making sure that the training and guidance Right? Is context specific, right? Is, is appropriate. Uh, maybe there's some employees where you want to uh, talk about the right things to put in email, but there are some employees who may never touch email, right? So, how do you make sure that their communications are what they're supposed to be and they're not running afoul of the program that the company has put in place? Uh, one of the keys, uh, and this really goes across the spectrum of compliance, not just in harassment or employment, but in all fields, is making sure that people who step on the wrong side. Of the, of the rules are truly disciplined as they're supposed to be, right? Because there's nothing that will gut a program like uh, people who are given um, uh, a second chance uh, where a second chance really should not have been afforded, right? Um, and, and then we'll continue to monitor and test uh, over the time that we are here. Um, there are, of course, uh, certain things that we we'll look for. We're quite familiar with the EEOC's guidelines on, on harassment and, and things that they look from at, from a federal level and they're uh, well publicized. We think that those are instructive for this, this field. <coughs> uh, and so by the way of, as you see on, on, on the uh, screen, by the way of baseline reporting and recommendations, we'll look for those things. We have the, this team as a whole has the, um, 
experience of, uh, in, in compliance, of understanding what the best practices are, for example, from other agencies that uh, can be applied in the human resources field. I'm very familiar with the Department of Justice's policies, very familiar, of course, having worked with the EEOC. So we're, we're looking forward to the opportunity uh, to help here. I believe Commissioner Stubbins, you asked about communication with the, with the Commission during this process. Mm -hmm. We'll, of course, in six months have a baseline report that will outline our in initial findings. We expect that there will be, as there is with any monitorship and any compliance program of you, a number of recommendations that, that we would make at that point. Um, part, our work plan will reflect a proposed cadence of communication, and that will, of course, be in communication with the commission or with the contract manager, uh, what makes sense based on key markers in the work plan so that we're giving you meaningful information and not just a you know, short status update. No, and I appreciate that. Obviously, in a, uh, just thinking about reporting in appreciate your thoughts and kind of a cadence and the schedule to it and, and I'm sure this has certainly been on the minds of my colleagues and the review team is if something comes up that's timely and we need to know about that we're not waiting for a prescribed reporting period. We want to know it now um, so we can try to address it. But. That would be something that we would commit to you and of course something that we would be asking from the company as well. So for instance, if there were allegations relevant to human resources policies that are during, within the purview of the monitorship, we would want to know that so that we have the benefit of, of course, not coming in and descending upon the company to do what the company should be doing in reviewing allegations, but to monitor the process of that review and of that investigation and follow up. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the baseline. Uh, I, I'd like to just um, uh, um, speak a little, uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, this is, uh, as, per, uh, as per, in our opinion, and also by many actions that they have taken, a company that's different from when the allegations, when when um, when the activity happened. Um, there is new executive team. There is a uh, new procedures, one that I suspect you'll be analyzing. But um, can you speak a little, and, and uh, a, a new VP of HR at a corporate level, and, and many other things. Um, a lot of which took place in great way as a result of the investigation of our own IEB uh, and, and the company responding to, um, to that. Mm -hmm. How much in your baseline uh, are you looking at the history out of necessity, for which we have a lot of documentation, by the way, and you mentioned that you have read some and might read more. Um, and how much is now the assessment of the current company when you look at that baseline? The short answer is we will be assessing the current company. Mm -hmm. And we've reviewed many, the company put forward a white paper that explains the many changes that they've made to the company. Mm -hmm in specifically the compliance program. That being said, we do have to look not to reinvestigate by any measure past allegations, mm -hmm. but we do want to make sure that the measures that have been put in place now do directly respond to the allegations and the alle that, that were made previously. That goes a bit to, you know, we're starting to understand what the risk profile of the company was, what it is now, and ensuring that the policies, procedures, and other structures within the organization would really be designed to prevent the recurrence of that past conduct. Mm -hmm. And I think more importantly, and this is you know something that we talk about when we talk about culture, is there have been changes at the very top of the organization. And very often when we come into a monitorship, that has already happened. But what we see is that there's a little bit of a tail for those changes at the top to permeate throughout the organization. So much of what we'll we be doing is not just testing the effectiveness of what's new, but how is that commitment being communicated across the organization? How has the culture throughout truly changed? And Preston's message about you know tone in the middle, um, you know, I would take that through the very top and you know very lower levels. Is there truly a belief that the culture has changed so that people understand that expect, what the expectations are for their own personal conduct and how they ultimately fit in to the survival and sustainability of the compliance program? 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's a related question. Um, uh, no I, I know you're. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I well, it's fresh in my mind. Um, you talk in your uh, presentation about uh, the need for and importance of efficiency. Yes. Um, as you, but the public also knows, the costs of this monitorship are going to be borne by the company. Um, the costs for the commission are borne by our licensees. And that, that freedom uh, we take very seriously um, and responsibly. Um, so can you speak a little bit about the balance that by definition you are probably going to have to strike relative to how much to dive into um, details, when to raise a yellow flag to say we need to reassess our estimate. Um, can you speak to that, uh, to your experience? In sure, that, uh, absolutely. Mindset? I think in our collective decades of experience um, really does drive our efficiency in these types of, of projects. We understand what stones need to be turned and what stones don't. Um, we take that approach both in a compliance program and frankly in internal investigations very often what you know you might perceive against our, our interest because <laughs> the more hours we build, typically law firms get paid, right? We don't operate under the model that we have to take a scor scorched earth to be satisfied that we know what we need to know. Um, so we would, again, look at the core elements of the compliance program that go to the issues that are within our purview. We're not going to look at policies that are outside of that, for example. Um, based on what we know, or Estimated fees right now, of course, are based on what we know of what's been publicly available. We think that's a good measure of what the work will take. If, for example, there are new allegations that surface, if there are multiple ongoing investigations or new investigations that surface while we're actively involved in the monitorship, I would expect that could change the scope of our work and therefore extend our fees potentially. But we would come to you well before we know that there might be an impact on our mm -hmm. estimated budget. Does that answer your if question? I, and if I could add, I believe, um, uh, Todd, you're at the disadvantage of not having a microphone, but uh, Mr. Grossman has explained that part of the contract will include, if I, if I'm, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, an internal controls for us to be able to um, really monitor invoices to, to confirm that uh, Miller and Chevalier's uh, invoices reflect the work plan, and and to the extent that it, the scope needs to expand, uh, one of the uh, factors that was part of our evaluation was their ability ability to be able to come back to open meeting, and be able to inform the entire commission of of such expansions. Uh, working in uh, and being subject to the open meeting is 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 a structure that not all of our um, uh, respondents had some familiarity with they because of their work they did have familiarity with that so there will be internal controls to monitor budgeting and scope expansion etc and they'll be uh, as you as you heard a reporting channel that will allow for um, us to be informed without getting in the way of their independence if i could put a final point on that on that issue Millen Chevalier takes pride in our efficiency, uh, and we're well known for it. Um, in addition to that, with Alejandra having served as a general counsel, and, and I've served in the House as well, we've been purchasers of legal services, yes. so we know when they've gone too far and when they've not, and that's yes. how we run our practices. So. Uh, good morning, and thank you for being here. Um, so it looks like you really put a, a terrific team together. It appears that just reading all of your bios, that it really is a team that can can work efficiently. I was um, I was particularly pleased to see the extent of the um, the monitoring experience, and I know that the team valued that. I think that piece is really important. And um, having come from an organization that I dealt uh, under a consent decree, dealt with federal monitors. Mm -hmm. Um, for a five-year period, um, understand the role, and it's a different role than advising a client, say, yes. on yes, compliance, is. and yes. you touched on that. Could you just expound upon how you see that role as a little bit different than your, your normal course of business, which is advising clients appropriately? 
it's independent, right? It's 100% independence. As an attorney representing a company, you're, you're giving advice, anticipating perhaps that in the future you may have to advocate and mm -hmm. defend that compliance program. Never compromises your counsel, never mm -hmm. compromises the advice that you're going to give. Um, he, here, we, there's 100% independence. There's no um, personal skin in the game, if you will. I mean, I don't want that to be misinterpreted, but it's mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're evaluating the program based on your expectations, based on legal requirements that apply to it. Um, our experience, of course, ensures that we'll give practical recommendations. Mm -hmm. no. But it's to protect, again, the, the public interest and in your goals and objectives of ensuring that your enforcement authority is, is being followed. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that uh, I thought were important, transparency mm -hmm. and effective communication. Um, again, back to my experience with monitors, um, those who uh, communicated effectively um, really did, uh, it helped with the buy-in of yes. organizational change. Um, so I, I was happy to see that in your response that you really talked about your independent but you really need that effective communication in order to be successful. We want this to succeed, right? We want, at the end of the day, for the company to have a compliance program that works. We will have failed if that doesn't happen. Um, that, that is a goal. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just uh, a couple other questions that I had. Um, I also, I think, to, to Commissioner Cameron's point, um, I did like a lot of what you provided about the approach, um, specifically working with the company to make sure that there are no surprises when your reports are finalized. Everybody has been com in communication. There's no kind of strict adversarial relationship with, with the entity that yes. you're monitoring. Um, uh, I also uh, was impressed with the level of uh, monitoring compliance work that you've done with respect to HR policies. I think your, your experience and uh, some harassment issues in the workplace um, helped me get a better sense of when you talk about, you know, one of the scope requirements, how that work translates also into incorporating best practices, which might come from your experience with other entities or it might come just with general familiarity of what's current out there in the business best practice world. Give me an idea of how you've had that experience in the past. Not just looking at what they're doing and making sure it conforms with the law, but finding opportunities to integrate, you know, what's what's new in the business world in terms of best practice. Sure. I mean I think a lot of that comes from what we do every day, right? I mean we're working, like I said earlier, with companies across all industries that are implementing compliance programs in these and other spaces. And, you know, we frankly learn a lot from our clients from their own creativity we give the recommendations ultimately how they implement it is theirs so just to give you an example one of the areas that many companies struggle with is how to test the effectiveness of a training program right you have your employees who go online they do the training um, how do you test the effectiveness we have given recommendations like put you know questions at the end of every module and see how employees score we've had um, companies that take it further and they, for example, will have trivia weeks or trivia months that are drawing from trainings that have been given in the past quarter, let's say, at a company to see how their employees are really internalizing. Um, my own company had, a, when we're talking about incentivizing, Preston talked about enforcement and discipline, a large part of what we look at, too, is the upside, right, the carrot side of compliance, which is how do you incentivize your employees to act by your policies and uphold your company values. Um, one of the things that my own company did was every quarter we would have a values award, and the different offices and operations would nominate from employee ranks who they thought best represented the integrity value, for example, or the accountability value. Based on that, we'll almost call it like library of what we've seen other companies do on their own and that we have been able to recommend and help our clients implement. We bring what would fit to this company, we would bring those types of recommendations to them. And of course, always reading legal opinions that start to give us a sense of what 
agencies are also expecting and trending towards for best practices. To that last point, we're in a, a particular time, the EEOC is, as we've seen, uh, where, where I think alongside the Department of Justice, compliance is no longer new, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're now kind of seeing kind of what works and things have been tested and so now this has been boiled down into how do we move the ball, right? How do we make our, these programs more effective? Uh, the fact that the EEOC now has reconvened its task force right on harassment, I think, is a, a testament to that. Uh, and those are things that, that are certainly in our sights. Uh, we know that those may not necessarily define all of the things that you want to see from this company, but they're, they're a good backdrop, right, that, that helps us understand what the best practices are. Any further questions for our guests? <clears throat> Commissioner O'Brien, uh, did you have any comments for our guests or anything? I know that you participated on the procurement team. Uh, I know that we we thank you for coming today. No, I, I don't don't take my silence as <laughs> apathy. It's more like I said, I lived it live. I, I, I was part of the initial presentation, and for me, one of the most important things was prior monitorship experience because I do think there is a distinction yes. between advising a client and acting as a monitor. Uh, and I was very impressed with the depth of it at your firm uh, and, and, and the depth of the team that you put together, um, which is, you know, no small part why you sit before the commission today. I think the other questions that have been asked, I, we vetted fully before. Um, I don't think there's anything additional uh, that I think I would want to bring forward to the other commissioners other than what's already been presented. I think I would only add to that in addition to uh, the focus on uh, HR matters, we also focused on corporate compliance and best practices and you bring extensive uh, uh, experience and depth in that field and, and, and your team reflects that. I also should note that your additional team members are included in the packet. It's not lost on me that the chair of the firm is part of that depth. And she has uh, extensive independent monitorships. I have to uh, acknowledge her, Catherine Cameron Atkinson, because um, she did what I think was very generous. She had that direct experience. She's there for a resource for you. But she sent the team that she knew could accomplish this and that could win the, um, the uh, respect and the award. So uh, to the, the chair of your firm, I, I really congratulate her for, for having the uh, wisdom to send such an impressive team. With that said, I think we've got business to do, and I think that, um, as you heard from uh, uh, Mr. Grossman, we are looking to, um, I understand that we are looking for a vote or, uh, from our legal team here in this case. Do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm happy to move that the Commission ratify the selection uh, by the procurement review team of Miller and um, Chevalier. Am I saying that properly? Yes, it's the Tennessee Charter? pronunciation okay. of Chevalier. <laughs> as the independent monitor of Wynn Mass LLC as described in the Commission's April 30th, 2019 suitability decision and the Commission enter into a contract with the firm uh, outlining the terms of engagement. We'll take these one by one. These motions? It's the first motion. Second. Any further questions? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0, Catherine, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I, I, I believe you're interested and actually would be uh, very strong as a contract manager. I would love to. Um, Designate uh, move that we designate Usain, but I'm, I'm I'm assuming that's the job you would. Um, I shouldn't assume. I'm asking if you would uh, if you would be interested in that position for the commission. Yes, I would be interested. I'm wondering if there should have been a little bit further explanation of that rule. Should should we invite Mr. Grossman to explain that? Not to displace any of you. Maybe we can. He can come sit where Mr. Verjojan <laughs> said, let's, let's displace the executive director. Oh. <laughs> There's a little bit of advance, but I, 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 I did not understand the um, um, 
quite properly, I, I was not aware of the motion, so I think it probably merits some discussion given that there's a motion. Mm -hmm. The contract manager um, serves, in, in my estimation, as a, in, in the first instance, as a conduit between the, uh, the vendor, in this case, uh, Miller and Chevalier, and the commission. Understanding that the commission itself can't make itself available on a moment's notice to resolve any issues that may arise. Questions about travel, things of that nature. Uh, we're going to go talk to this person. Is that OK? Stuff like that um, is important that there be a person who can respond quickly um, and be nimble, but still has the ability every other week or however often the commission meets to come in and report as appropriate as to what types of issues have arisen. Secondly, it's important, and the commission can do this as a whole, but it would be helpful to have one person assigned to ensure that the work that is being done is within the confines of the work plan as the commission will ultimately approve and to really be focused on that individually. And certainly the contract manager can consult with other commissioners consistent, of course, with the open meeting law and not violating any of those principles. Uh, but to have one person focused on that seems like an important thing to do, to have a look at any invoices uh, that come in, to keep a watchful eye, not that it would go astray on uh, the billing and things of that nature. So that's how I would envision the contract manager role to unfold in a situation like this. And I think that it's unusual because typically we would have our executive staff and operations team take uh, care of these matters, but because this is part of a decision that was, con that was made by uh, the commission as part of an adjudicatory decision, I think that that was why it would be recommended that it stay with a member of the commission. When we discussed this, to be fully transparent, I, um, I thought that made great sense, but I also recognize that I am able to speak with a fellow commissioner, and I pledged that if we do hear from our awarded um, uh, monitor, uh, even if it is something about travel, I would always turn to Commissioner O'Brien to let her know about the inquiry. With that said, if there was a particular specialty, perhaps on finance or something, I could, without violating open meeting rules, I'd always check in with legal uh, to speak with perhaps mm -hmm. Commissioner Zuniga. So that would allow us to keep it and also uh, use the judgment of Commissioner O'Brien uh, as appropriate um, with respect to open meeting laws to say this really needs to come before the commission. It's a matter for that. With that said, we also have in the our decision uh, the company, when Mass, when Resorts has the ability also to raise any concerns that they may have with respect to matters that arise with this very important relationship that they'll be developing and navigating with you. And so that would also be the kind of contact that would come through the commissions. And the reason why is that it would absolutely um, ensure that everything is conducted in the open meeting set, setting rather than what n normally is conducted as operational. So is that fair? That's right. Okay. Well, I'm very comforted with uh, the involvement that, that you describe, uh, especially given the fact that you were um, involved all the way from the beginning in drafting the RFP. Uh, the, 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 the two of you, uh, you chair in consultation with not just Commissioner O'Brien, but the rest of the staff that, as I mentioned earlier, brought a real important diversity of um, skills with Derek in finance and Agnes, as well as um, um, Loretta and, um, and Todd. So I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable with, uh, if, you, if you so choose, uh, if you are so accepted to, um, to designate you as a contract manager, understanding that that's the approach you will take. Well, why don't I um, put that in the form of a motion? All right. Uh, I move that the chair be designated by the commission as a contract manager for purposes of providing supervision over the monitorship. The contract manager shall be authorized to make decisions necessary to ensure that the monitoring activity remains fluid. Um, 
will be will, uh, but will utilize her best judgment to determine whether any particular issue should be brought before the commission for review. I further move that the chair be authorized to execute the contract between the commission and Miller and um, Chevalier after consultation with the legal department. Second. Any further questions? Commissioner Stebbins, all set? All set. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, opposed? I believe, um, do I need to abstain or is it part of my, the job? You can abstain. I'm, I'm in favor of this arrangement. <laughs> <laughs> She's available 24-7. Yeah. Noted. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you thank you very much for your much. time and for thank this you. opportunity. Thank you. Look forward to the partnership. Likewise. Yes, thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. We've been uh, requested for a five-minute uh, break before our, our next presentation. Again, thank you to our, our, our next guest for your patience. We appreciate it. So five minutes. Austin, I'm not sure if I said a proper good morning to you, so thank you. Um, we're now turning to item three on our agenda. We have reconvened public meeting number 275. Uh, good morning. Uh, Ombudsman Ziemba, here you are. I'm looking for you over there. Thank you. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, today we have presentations from the town of Plainville and Plain Ridge Park. Uh, first up is a presentation by the town of Plainville regarding its recently completed uh, municipal complex. Uh, Executive Director Bedrosian attended the opening of this excellent new facility on behalf of the commission. I know that many commissioners have also had the opportunity to uh, either see the facility recently or during its construction. And so with that, let me turn it over to Jennifer Thompson, uh, Plainville Town Administrator, Jeff Johnson, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Mark Bartnazzi, Building Commissioner, uh, James Alfred, Chief of Police, and Justin Alexander, Fire Chief, to begin their presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having, having us. Um, you know, this is such a wonderful story to tell, and um, we're honored to be here. And um, we thought we would just kind of walk you through the process of um, how we got these beautiful buildings and, um, and give you some wonderful pictures to look at. I know many of you have seen it in person, and if um, if you haven't had a chance to come down since the buildings are open, um, I know a lot of you came during the construction. Um, you know, we would love for you to come down and take a tour, take a look. You can certainly um, host meetings there now that we have a beautiful meeting room, um, which the chair got to see on Monday. Um, so, you know, it's always open and welcome to the commission. So uh, thank you again for having us. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino, as you know, was the first facility in Massachusetts to uh, receive a license. They opened in 2015. Uh, with 1,250 slot machines. Uh, they made a $250 million investment in Plainville and in the Commonwealth. Um, and since then, it's had a tremendous economic uh, development impact in a very positive way, not only for Plainville, but our surrounding communities and the region as a whole. They are the largest, largest taxpayer in town, and um, they've created over 500 uh, jobs in the region. Those are just jobs in the facility. Um, there were also the jobs that were created from the actual construction of um, both Plain Ridge Park Casino and our municipal complex. So um, very significant positive um, impact on the town of Plainville and the region as a whole. So uh, one of the first things we did was negotiate our host community agreement. As you know, prior to opening, um, we sat down with um, Plain Ridge and we um, negotiated the agreement Whereas um, the first part is the taxes that they pay. They pay 2.5 million a year in real estate and property tax. That goes up two and a half percent every year. And then the second piece, which is really germane to our conversation today, is the community impact fees. 
So in years one through five, after the full opening, they pay the town 2.7 per, per year, 2.7 million per year. In years six through 10, that changes, and we shift to 1.5% of their gross gaming revenue. And then after that, years 11 and beyond, it switches to 2% of gross gaming revenue. So as you can see, it's a true partnership, pub public-private partnership, um, and um, you know, we in the town of Plainville are committed to their success, um, as I know the Gaming Commission and the Commonwealth is as well. Um, these community impact fees, the town of Plainville made a very, very smart decision very early on, and that was to put those fees into a, a gaming, we call it the Gaming Capitalist, Capital Stabilization Fund. It was actually special um, legislation that the town filed, and those funds go into a special account to be used for um, capital expenses. And there were a few reasons why we did that. So years ago, the town of Plainville, um, this is a lovely picture of our old town hall. <laughs> the town of Plainville um, had a landfill, a landfill. And um, we had a host community agreement with the landfill and received re revenues from the landfill every year. And what the town did for decades was they took that money and they used it to fund the operating budgets of the town. So they were able to keep taxes pretty low. Um, I think the chief will tell you for a decade, taxes were never raised in the town um, because they used the funds from the landfill to supplement um, the operations of the, of the town. What happened was the landfill closed and that extra source of revenue was gone. And the town was faced with um, a significant fiscal crisis um, when that happened because they no longer had that revenue coming in. So, um, you know, people were laid off, positions were cut, um, and I would say over the last decade, there really hasn't been um, any investment in the infrastructure and in the buildings in the town because the town just simply didn't have the money to do it. So we were very um, uh, careful that we didn't want to create that. We didn't want to create um, uh, revenue going into the operating budget just in the event that the casino someday is not there. Um, so we wanted to um, use the lessons that we had from the landfill and um, create some tangible and material things that would last um, maybe long after the casino was gone if it's not there um, 50 years from now. So, um, and we also had a significant need for capital investment, especially in our buildings, which you'll see. So this was the existing facilities. This was the town hall. The picture on the left was actually my office when I started with the town, but also the room where the Board of Selectmen met. And it, the room is not much bigger than that actual picture, if you have ever been there. Um, I'm sure uh, the folks from Plain Ridge that are here went to many meetings in that room, and it was um, incredibly limited, never mind not um, accessible for um, handicapped individuals. The second floor is what we had for limited storage um, and other meeting space up on the second floor of the building. Again, no elevator, no access for people with disabilities. Um, these were, this is the, a picture of our HVAC systems, and um, my building commissioner is here uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because he had to deal with these buildings, and two, because we decided to use him as um, the owner's project manager on the new facilities, which we'll talk about in a little while. But um, I think he, more than anyone, can tell you what the struggles were dealing with um, an outdated HVAC and heating system, or lack thereof I, is probably a better way of uh, of saying it. Looks like there was only one setting in that uh, HVAC system. Yes, exactly. Sometimes. So the picture on the left is what you would call the public bathrooms in our town hall, but um, we only had two bathrooms, um, men's and a women's, and um, they were shared by both the staff and the public, so there was no separate uh, public bathroom versus the staff that were working there. And again, there were only two. Um, there was no functioning kitchen or break room. Um, we had like a little fridge stuffed in a server room. There was no, you know, even employees didn't have a place to like wash their dishes when they brought their lunch in. Um, you know, so they, you know, would wash them in the bathroom sink or throw them away. That's our very um, sophisticated electrical panel in the old town hall. <laughs> Um, this was my office um, about two months before we actually moved into the new facility and the ceiling had collapsed. We had um, a flood and um, some pooling of water on the roof and um, I walked in on a Monday morning and this is what my office looked like. The ceiling had collapsed. Um, and the public safety facility was in, um, in the same, 
in the same type of shape and had some of the unique challenges above and beyond what we had at the town hall. As you can see on the picture on the left, um, the facility was not ADA compliant and people you know, in wheelchairs and using canes and, and stuff like that had very, a, a lot of difficulty getting into the buildings. <coughs> Excuse me. The picture on the right is um, we ran out of space in terms of where to store the apparatus. And I think I'll let the fire chief talk a little bit about this, if he doesn't mind. Um, this is actually a facility across the street from the fire department. And if um, you wouldn't mind, chief, just explaining what you had to do. So when, uh, right around the time the casino <coughs> opened, um, uh, incident volume went up, so we changed our staffing level. But in order to house our staff, the additional staff, we had to put the trucks outside. And that doesn't work well with water in the winter. So fortunately, across the street from the station, it's what you see in the picture on the right, uh, we were able to rent that space. Uh, it cost about fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a month, and we were able to put some of our auxiliary apparatus into that to store across the street. So when those trucks were needed, often you had to move two or three different trucks to get the truck out that you wanted because they were stacked in front of each other, and you had to get your gear on across the street and walk out and walk across the street, which was busy one A, and it was a dangerous crossing, and then move the trucks to get them out, and it would add minutes and minutes to our response time. Uh, but fortunately, thanks to this whole situation, we don't have that problem anymore. Um, this is, these are pictures, again, of the public safety building on the right is what they had for um, you know, storage. It was, if you walk through that building, it was any little crevice that you could find they would use for storage because that's really all they had. Uh, this next picture on the left is actually a view from one of the cells inside the, pres um, inside the police department. And the view that you're looking at and um, I'll have the police chief talk about this a little bit, is um, I believe to the administrative assistance office. That's correct. Good morning. Um, yeah, so the view you're looking at is my secretary's office, which is lit up, from the, the pictures being taken from the cell doors. So every morning um, when we take the prisoners out to go to court, I'd have to stand in front of the secretary's door for safety. Um, we, the facility was very small. She got uh, to meet an awful lot of uh, interesting people over the years. She served with the town for 38 years. She's retiring this year. Um, so and she's very happy to be in the new facility uh, where I don't have to stand in front of the door and, and guard her. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, storage was obviously a challenge in both buildings. We didn't have adequate um, space for any of our storage needs. Um, the left is just some additional storage that I think the fire department added. Um, you know, a lot of just auxiliary pieces of, you know, buildings and sheds and stuff that we had to use. That's, again, I think the HVAC system, perhaps, in the, in the public safety building. And you can see, just to the left, using whatever we could for space in terms of storage. On the left is what we had for a training room. You can see how limited that would be for roll call and, um, you know, the, both departments trying to get their, um, you know, employees into one space was a challenge. The cells were not compliant with um, current regulations. That's the picture on the right. Um, on the left, those are um, the other issue that we had in public safety was um, gender separation. So we didn't have proper gender separation for our female officers. So the chief rented a um, modular building, I guess we'll call it. I'll let you go ahead and tell that story. <laughs> so we had to rent a, a, a trailer, basically, uh, and then have it built a uh, hallway built from the existing building into the trailer so that we could have s two separate locker rooms, one, uh, one for the men and one for the females, uh, so, which we didn't have for years. We actually had a uh, bulletin board that separated the boys and the girls, so to speak, uh, <laughs> for a locker room. Uh, and that we were all crowded into uh, one, one small room. We outgrew that um, as the town um, grew, especially over the last few years. So uh, that was the only thing we could do for uh, for some type of facility for, for both would be a, a modular trailer. So. And then the picture on the right is the um, public restroom in the public safety building. Uh, so obviously, um, you know, the town, I, I was hired in 2015 right after the casino opened and um, most of you know Joe Fernandez who was the mm -hmm. town manager before I and um, you know, he really um, worked incredibly hard with the gaming commission and with Penn um, to get the casino to come to town and also was very um, instrumental in getting that capital fund set up. 
Um, and then he retired and I got to reap the benefits of it. So thank you to Joe. Um, but so we got together um, a year later after the casino had opened and started to talk about what we were going to do with those funds. And um, you know, obviously you can see from the pictures, there was a clear need to do something with those buildings. Um, and, and so what did we want that to look like? So in 2016, we went before town meeting for an appropriation for um, a study, a feasibility study, and a design. We didn't want to wait a whole year to get the design going. I mean, I think we kind of all thought that the best location was going to be where we had, um, it's called the old, it was the old wood school. It was um, right behind the library. Um, and it was a school that had been va vacant for 12 years. Um, we built new schools. And um, you know, it was town-owned land. So it just kind of seemed like the obvious place, but um, you know, you have to go through that process and make sure you're considering all your options. Um, there was a lot of discussion in the town on whether or not we could renovate that school. Um, I think all of us at the table knew that that was going to be probably not only challenging, but not cost efficient. The building, you know, a vacant building for 12 years um, has a lot of um, challenges with it. For, you know. So we had, but we had to go through that process. There were people in the town that were very tied to that school because they had gone to school or sent their children to that school. So um, you know, there was a desire to at least look at it to see if we could save it. Um, but it certainly, um, I think we all knew in the back of our minds that it probably wasn't going to be able to stay. But in 2016, we, um, we got that appropriation at town meeting. Um, to move forward with the feasibility and the study. And we used the funds from the host community agreement to fund that. So no tax dollars were used for um, the feasibility study or the design. And this is just one of the slides we presented at town meeting. Um, on the first, um, the first section, you'll see the old Fox Market, which is um, a building that's, um, if you've been to that center district of Plainville, um, that was really the grocery store in the downtown. And um, Jeff Kinney, who's an author and who lives in town. He's one of my favorite authors. <laughs> He's definitely my son's favorite author, yes. without a doubt. Um, but he has done a wonderful job. He um, purchased the property and then rebuilt it to look just like the, to look like the original market. And um, it's a beautiful bookstore and cafe. They have events there. And if you haven't been there, it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, so that's at, you know, one kind of corner of the, um, we'll call it an anchor of the downtown. And what we wanted to do was look at whether or not we built the municipal complex next to the library. Um, so added these two buildings in the same, um, you know, proximity of the library to kind of generate, um, you know, that, that downtown feel and that center district feel that we're trying to accomplish there. Um, so that's what these slides kind of represent. We showed. Um, you know, what the market used to look like, what Mr. Kinney did, what our public safety building looked like, what it could look like, um, and the same with the town hall, which is very interesting looking back because our buildings, these aren't our buildings, this is just kind of what we envisioned, but they ended up looking very similar to these. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we looked at the location where the library was, the school was right behind it. Um, we knew that we owned the land, so we wouldn't have to purchase the land. Uh, the proximity to the town center, um, we wanted to look at a building that would complement the library if we were going to go there and then kind of create that sense of community in the downtown area. Uh, these are just some pictures of the old wood school and what it looked like. So um, as, I, as I said, 12 years can have um, certainly some effects on the building. And um, these are just inside pictures. That's a classroom on the right, it's the ceiling on the left. Um, the flooring, you know, we had asbestos and all kinds of things in there that you would expect from an old building. That's just the front of the building and those are um, different sections of the stairs on the right. Um, let me just go back for one second. So, so we evaluated the building, we, you know, we, what we thought came true and, and um, the architects made a recommendation that the building be demo, um, demolished and that we move forward with building uh, the buildings in that, on that land. So a year later, we presented at town meeting um, a plan and a rendering. This is a rendering of what the buildings might look like. And we proposed a new municipal complex um, at a cost of $34 million, which would include demolition of that, that old school. But what we proposed, which is different than any other town had ever proposed in Massachusetts, was paying for all of it out of the host community funds. So we would borrow the $34 million and then make the payments on that note from the payments that we received through our host community agreement. 
Um, it, was it was a remarkable experience because we were the first to ever have done it. It was um, embraced by the town. We were able to build a municipal facility without using one dollar of tax dollars, which is amazing. Um, we didn't have to raise taxes to do it. And um, it was a unanimous decision at town meeting. We were actually applauded um, when we did the presentation. So it was, it was wonderful. And um, you know, it was the people at this table that are really responsible for that. So this is just a, a picture of the rendering when we did present at town meeting. And it just shows you the libraries on the right. And right across from it, you see what is now the new town hall. And then in the back is where that school used to be. And that's the public safety building. They also have an auxiliary kind of outbuilding to the right, which we built because um, it was a much less cost to um, construct that particular area rather than make it part of the, the, exist, the public safety building. So we did that to save money. Again, that was just another picture of we wanted to create this kind of boulevard entrance as you walk in. And um, you know, as the, we tried to keep as many trees as we could keep. And um, the, you know, there's certainly more growing in. But we really wanted to create this park feeling in between the building that members of the community could go to and um, you know if they are doing business at town hall or visiting the library or going to the public safety building they also might want to sit on a bench and just enjoy um, the area and enjoy the complex this was our groundbreaking and commissioner cameron was there it was wonderful to have her and um, it was a wonderful day we had um, you know everyone that had been involved in the process there and uh, and um, we moved forward with construction these are just some pictures of the school as it was being demolished. And then you can see the pictures of the footprint starting to come to life on the right. Again, these are um, on the right is the town hall being constructed. On the left is the public safety building being constructed. And then we had these beautiful buildings. So um, on the right is that boulevard entrance that I talked about. When you enter into the complex, the public safety building is right ahead of you. The library is on the right, and the town hall is on the left. On the left is our new town hall building, and on the right is the public safety building. And I mentioned to you earlier in the presentation that um, we chose to have our building commissioner serve as the owner's project manager, the OPM on the project. So if you know anything about public construction in Massachusetts, if your buildings or your projects are going to be over a certain amount, you have to have a onus project manager on the project that is looking out for the best interests of the town. Um, a lot of times people go out and they hire an outside firm to, to do that. We felt that it was important for us to have someone in-house who was invested in the project um, there with their feet on the ground and their eyes on the, on the project. Um, and that's why we chose Mark. And it was, without a doubt, the best decision we have ever made. Um, we also had an assistant OPM on the job, so when Mark couldn't be there, he was there. And um, in my opinion, it made a tremendous difference in terms of the quality that we received on the job. Um, the other thing that we did is the fire chief and the police chief were very, and their staff, were very involved in the actual designs of the building and the construction. So all of them went to all of the construction meetings every week throughout the process because ultimately, they're the ones that are going to live in that building. So while the architect was wonderful, they don't know what it's like to be a police officer or a firefighter um, or work in a town hall. So for us, it was important that we get those key people involved right from the beginning. Um, and now that we're in the buildings, I think it made a world of difference. So. These are our new meeting rooms. So you saw the picture in the very beginning of what our existing meeting room was like. Now this on the left is our town hall meeting room with the Board of Selectmen, Planning Board, and all of our major boards meet, as well as members of the community uh, that need to have meetings can use that space. On the right is the training facility for public safety. <clears throat> on the if left if is I the oh, just sorry, back sure. up, If you wanted to mention the craftsmanship of oh. the Right. The board um, uh, desk, yes. if you will. That's a great story. So, um, you know, obviously when you're building buildings and you're um, using public funds, you want to make sure that you're um, doing everything that you can to be, um, you know, cost efficient. So we had uh, gotten a price for that, you know, credenza, so to speak, um, where the boards will sit behind. And um, I think the price was around 50 or 60 thousand just for that one piece um, and it's you know it's all solid wood and it's beautiful 
Um, but you know, when we got the price, again, being kind of involved hands-on, we were like, that seems like a lot of money to spend on something like that. And someone had the idea of reaching out to um, the prisons, so um, the correctional industries in Massachusetts, to see if they did something like that, and they did. So um, the Department of Corrections actually had um, their correctional industries folks make the credenza, the two um, desks that you see in front of it, and then there's a podium, um, and I think we got all, all four of them for $11,000. So it was, um, they did a remarkable job, and you, you know, as the chair mentioned, when you see it in person, um, the attention to detail, it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, the left is just the foyer and the entrance into the public safety building. The right is a picture of the booking area, um, and um, I think that picture's coming in from like the Sally Port, right, Chief? On the left, again, it, there's an actual sally port that you can drive in and drive out of, not have to back into. Um, on the right is um, a meeting space in police that they use for their roll call and for any other meetings that the chief needs to have, so you can actually fit them all in one place now. Um, and then the other thing that we did is prior to opening, we held open houses in the town hall in the public safety building, so before we actually moved in, but the buildings were complete, we invited the public to come in and see them. And um, we had an amazing turnout. It was wonderful to see people come in and remark at how beautiful the buildings were, um, how happy they were that we weren't raising their taxes to build them. Um, and, and just, um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So that's um, people coming out of the public safety building. That's the apparatus floor on the fire side. Those are some folks getting a tour of um, the dispatch area, some folks getting a tour of the dining and kitchen area in the public safety building. And then in April of 2019, on the 4th, um, which is actually the anniversary of uh, the town of Plainville, we had our ribbon cutting. And um, Director Bedrosian came down and spoke, and we had a lot of town officials there. Um, Joe Fernandez was there, and all the former selectmen that were involved. Um, Penn National was there. So it was, it was a wonderful day. Cold, but a wonderful day. And again, these are just some, some additional pictures from the ribbon cutting. <coughs> so, you know, last but not least, we want to thank the citizens of Plainville who supported us. We certainly want to thank the Gaming Commission who has been incredible and supportive to us. Um, you'll notice that that picture is of the new truck that we just it's got. It's a great truck. The, uh... <laughs> great looking truck. I like so it. I'll tell a little story about the truck. So, you know, being the first to kind of get the first license, you know, you try to think of all the things that you're going to need, but none of us have ever been in a, you know, worked in a town that had a casino before. Um, and one of the things that we didn't realize at the time was Plain Ridge was building a parking garage and that none of our trucks that were responding to emergencies could fit in the parking garage. So if you had a car fire or a medical emergency, um, they had to kind of deal with it from the outside. They couldn't get into the parking garage. So, and Chief, feel free to jump in if I'm not explaining it correctly, but um, when the Gaming Commission came out with the um, you know, grant funding and, and um, mitigation funding, it was perfect for us because it was something that we just didn't think of as we were going through the process. So we're very grateful that the Commission um, you know, looked at our application and then helped us with funding for that truck. So. We and by the way, by the way, I, I understand also that that truck allows you to get into areas, in other areas in town where yes. you couldn't otherwise. Is that is that correct? Yeah. That's great. So certainly, thank you to the board of selectmen and the permanent building committee, which you know did all this work that I'm telling you about. And um, you know, on, as we built the, the projects, our legislative delegation. I mentioned Joe Fernandez, and of course, um, you know, I can't end the presentation without thanking Penn National. Um, just a you know, a, a little bit of a plug for us is that, you know, we, I know for me personally, I've been in municipal government my entire career, and the thing that you always hear people talk about is why aren't there more public and private partnerships? Um, we are very fortunate in Plainville that we have a wonderful public and private partnership with Penn National. They have been incredible um, to deal with. Um, we have virtually no issues in the town. I'll, you know, let Jeff kind of you know, he's the one that probably hears it the most from constituents if you do hear complaints, and um, everyone is very happy that they're there. Um, it's, it's just they've been wonderful to deal with. So uh, anything we can do to continue to help them and help them stay competitive, 
um, the town is, is there to support them. So. Absolutely. They've been a tremendous partner to us all, and the residents are very pleased with everything we've done together with them. So we're going to work, be working hard with them in the future. And the future is something that Jen didn't mention in that presentation, but those beautiful buildings, one of the things that I am most proud of is that these were designed to handle Plainville for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, it feels big when you walk in and it feels open and airy and that's great, but it also feels like as Plainville grows, we're going to grow into those buildings even, even better. And so we, I don't have to go back to the townspeople and say in five years, oh, we need to build an addition or something on there. So very well planned, well designed. And the other thing I would say, and, and thank you, Madam Chairman, for pointing out that wonderful uh, desk area, table area in the meeting room. I think the commission would look great sitting behind it at one of your fall meetings. <laughs> so you're invited. Uh, well, there may be a racing hearing uh, that we you should we usually come come to Plainbridge for the racing I, hearings. I, I don't know. We may miss the yeah. um, the senior center with the square dancing <laughs> in the back. <laughs> we may miss that when we, we come we, to the new building. We might need a before and after picture as well. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, Great presentation. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, obviously, the town um, used money wisely. Um, I know in dealing with uh, Chief Alexander, Chief Alfred, I frankly have never been in nicer police facilities or fire facilities. The old pictures look like some of my old offices. So <laughs> it brought back memories um, of, of uh, what things used to be like in public safety. So really tremendous. Um, you know, partnership, as you say, and um, I look forward to, I, I toured right before you opened, so I need to get out again now that, uh, now that uh, folks are there and to see it really working uh, full time as it should, but, uh, but great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Really impressive. Great, great presentation. Um, and just a, a special shout out to Jennifer because she has always been willing to kind of take this good news story on the road. She was very gracious to uh, come up to Boston a few months back, talk to a group of real estate appraisers from across New England and helping them understand the value and the positive impact that a, uh, that a gaming facility can have on the communities. Thanks for helping to keep spinning that, this good news story out. Yeah, it's a great story. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you, uh, take the time to lay it out the way you do. Um, and congratulations, because these, these, these buildings look fantastic. Chief Alexander made such an impassioned um, presentation about the need for that fire truck. It's <laughs> nice to see it, uh, see it on the screen. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I, I want to thank you again for uh, the tour on Monday. Uh, Lane Triscoll, our communications director, accompanied me uh, the facilities are, are so very impressive. The training facilities that, at the public safety uh, building are state of the art, and you also have extensive meeting space. I was very pleased to learn that not only are uh, the residents of Plainville getting the benefit of that from the first responders, you know, the firefighters and the uh, police officers, but also that those facilities are shared regionally. Right now, we know that it's really important that regionally there's public safety strategies uh, being put in place, and we appreciate that uh, the uh, benefit that you receive through very, um, uh, sort of very clever, very smart uh, negotiations with the host agreement actually worked in a way that really advantaged your community, but also the surrounding communities and beyond. So I, I very much appreciated your time. So impressed by how these dollars were leveraged. And I missed you, Jennifer, but so I'm glad to meet you officially today. So thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Any further questions? Have you seen, I'm just curious as to uh, other aspects of, uh, you know, economic development, if you will, more uh, um, interest in, in people moving into town or some kind of um, uh, additional, um, commerce coming into the areas that you described around uh, the, the, the center of town? Yeah, so we've seen um, an uptick in interest in the area around Plain Ridge. For instance, there's a large development that is shared between Rentham and Plainville just on the opposite side of Interstate 495 that's opening up this fall mm -hmm. uh, with a couple of hotels and uh, restaurants and 
assisted living facility and, and storage facilities and lots of other business there. So that area has picked up interest. And we also uh, have seen some uh, increase on 1A, which is the, the main uh, track through town. Um, actually had a, a big hearing last just last week on a proposal for another new business there. So uh, we, we have seen a pickup. The other thing that's been good is that uh, the, the racing, the horse racing business um, mm -hmm. is doing very well there now. Um, whereas if you went back five or six years ago, oh, we did. Um, it, it mm -hmm. was really struggling. It, mm -hmm. It's doing much, much better now, which is great for not just Plainville, but our surrounding communities and the horse farms in the area. Uh, they recently added a new Clara Barton Cup for, um, for fillies and had a big Spirit of Massachusetts event uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was, it, it was actually won by a local local horse which was I thought was a great thing uh, so th that's been a benefit not just again not just Plainville but the towns around us mm -hmm. it's great to hear mm -hmm. thank you uh, <clears throat> the only thing that was missing was of course the live video that <laughs> I failed to get I saw uh, <clears throat> Chief we, we Alexander have. we will uh, get that to you for sure yeah I'll, I'll have to see it on the phone the Chief Alexander <laughs> demonstrated how to go down the the uh, fire pole. Uh -huh. If I had had jeans on, I would have accompanied you, but <laughs> I couldn't believe I did not take a photo. And apparently it's been redone, so I'll, I'll look forward to seeing that. Great. <laughs> thank you again. Thank and, you so much. Uh, and and uh, again, thank you to all the, the, the service of your teams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino, Mr. George, your patience. And I'm sure, though, that you, too, were excited to see, uh, again, I'm sure, a presentation you're familiar with. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Next up is the quarterly report for Plain Ridge Park for the second quarter. Um, that ended on June 30th of this year. Uh, today we're joined by Lance George, General Manager, Mike Miller, VP of Operations, and Michelle Collins, VP of Marketing. Uh, before I turn it over to Lance, I'd just like to give a very brief status update to the Commission regarding the potential extension of bus service to the Plain Ridge Park facility. While the service has not yet been established, uh, we know that Plain Ridge Park continues to work with local partners uh, to see how the service can be established. And so with that, let me just turn it over to Lance. Thank you, John. Yes, the, the only thing I remember about uh, the grand opening was how incredibly cold it was. I, I think I was sitting next to Executive Director Bedrosi, and I think I was shivering on him. Um, we'll jump right in. Uh, I think we're here. Did bring some cheating glasses because I'm in the habit of borrowing John Ziembas in past meetings, so I, I went the extra mile and bought a pair. Good job. We, we have a few pairs up here, too. Do you have a few up there as well? Yeah. I get it. <laughs> okay. Revenues. Uh, a busy slide, a lot going on here. I'll draw your attention to, to just a few of these numbers. Uh, Q2, year-over-year -year comparison of the second quarter, shows a decline of approximately 3.7% in revenue. Solid performance in the months of April and May, with a more significant decline in June. Obviously, a portion of June's performance would have been impacted by the opening of Encore. In a broader sense for us, the landscape has certainly changed. In a span of less than 12 months, three casinos have opened around Plain Ridge. We've got Tiverton to the east, MGM to the west, and as I previously just mentioned, Encore to the north. Encore in particular is a beautiful property, and certainly we've always anticipated our customers would visit. With that said, I would tell you that the impact to date to revenue has been in line with, with what we expected. All in for the second quarter, 2019. Combination of taxes paid to the Commonwealth and fees paid to the horsemen at 49%, approach 21 million, with gaming revenues over 42 million. Successful quarter for us. We continue to be pleased with, uh, with property revenues. Lance, um, just looking at, uh, at the prior slide, uh, just glancing up and down the quarters, um, from this is all these are all quarters that where MGM was was open yep. um, perhaps just picking up speed in uh, in the first one the first quarter of no the third quarter of uh, 2018 
Yes. Right. Q3 would have been Q3 the first have impact have of Tiverton and MGM. So, so is it fair to say that maybe there has been less impact from, or is, is it from MGM uh, opening, or is it too early sure. to to tell? I'm just comparing to Angkor. Um, uh, certainly, the imp we expect uh, that the impact will be uh, of Encore will be greater than what we experienced with the impact of both MGM and Tiverton. Yes. Right. Yes. Yep. Lottery sales. Again, a lot going on here. Uh, call your attention to just a few of these numbers. Consistent with property revenues, lottery sales saw a modest decline, approximately 5%. Uh, quarter two for 2019, total sales of over $885,000, a large number. Encouraging results and lottery sales continue to be a great story for us. Uh, again, as I always mention, if there are any changes or any marketing initiatives, there were no marketing initiatives that helped to drive that number. No change in the number of machines or outlets and no change to those locations. Just a, a, a continued good story for us. We sell a lot of lottery tickets. Spending and procurement. Next two slides go hand in hand. Uh, one is in-state spending um, and the other breaks it down a bit further. So for Q2 2019, 53% or approximately 900,000 of the eligible spend occurred in-state. The remainder is split among several other states, which can be seen broken down to the right. The 270,000 quarter over quarter increase to the in-state spend category is primarily driven by a few larger projects in which we were able to identify Massachusetts vendors. Uh, those vendors specifically, Ostro Electric, uh, Curry Buildings, and DDS Industries. Good work and, and continued diligence on behalf or on the part of uh, our procurement team. Uh, led to solid results for us for the in-state spending category. Um, Lance, I got to yep. stop you there because yep. um, you know it's 53 percent uh, for the second quarter. Your first quarter was 56 percent. If you look at second quarter 2018, you were spending 89 percent Massachusetts in your 2018 end result was about 26% in Massachusetts. So I'm worried our trend is going a little bit in the, in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, and, and that might be on account of, you know, national contracts or obviously, you know, the, the places uh, where you're spending money, the list, you know, stays pretty consistent. But, um, I think it might warrant, we don't need to do it today, but it might warrant having a conversation with you and Eli and just kind of helping us understand where these trends are going because I'm worried they're not going in the right direction. If you were trying to, you know, hit that 26% again for 2018, you'd have to have a pretty remarkable turnaround in terms of uh, in-state spend over the next two quarters. And I'm not sure that's what's planned, but I think we do need to sit down and get a, a little bit clearer picture on how this is unfolding. Happy to do that, certainly. All right, thank you. Uh, one additional slide. Here we go. Part of the breakdown of, of local spending here, which we typically do, approximately 77,000, or roughly 8% of the in-state procurement dollars for Q2 occurred in our local and surrounding communities with those dollars being spread uh, amongst all of the communities. This re number remains largely consistent with Q1 results uh, up approximately $16,000. Uh, I know that last year, I believe, last year, year over year Q2, we had a bigger number in our local spend. Uh, that comes down to a couple of large capital projects. So we had a roofing project last year. We re-roofed all of the paddocks and then we brought to life an old building that was sitting on the racing apron. So, so $150,000 alone spent in the town of Rentham, I believe, uh, with Bristol construction. So that's why you see that drop year over year. Fender diversity, you ever look here as well as comparing to our goals for Q2. Overall, as represented by the first set of bars, 28% of our spend fell into the category of a MBE, WBE, or a VBE. This number eclipses both prior year at 24%, as well as our goal of 21%. To the right of this is the detail behind the total. 
which shows a solid increase in the WBE category, largely driven by a few in-state vendors, notably Ipswich Shellfish, Mill Hench Industrial Supply, as well as Kitteridge Food Service Equipment. Targets were achieved for both MBE and VBL as well, with a modest decrease in the VBE category. And then finally, just uh, last slide on vendor diversity, comparing Q1 of 2019 to Q2 of 2019. Overall, the property continues to meet or exceed in each category, finding greater success in the WBE category for sure. While we have been consistent in achieving these goals in MBE and VBE categories, we are certainly focused on improving those results. Hope to return in a few months with increased percentages in both of those categories for you. With that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Mike. Good morning, Madam Chair of Commission. Good, Good morning. morning. Good afternoon. In reviewing our two Q2 employment numbers, we had 461 employees. 308 of those were full-time employees with 141 part-time. The 308 made up 67% of our staff, while the 141 part-time made up 31% of our staff. You can also see a 3% for seasonal, which is generally our racing employees. Our diversity hires came in at 26% of the total workforce. Our veterans remained steady at 5% of our workforce, and our Massachusetts-based hires made up 61% uh, of our workforce, while our, local, while our local hires were 33%. Our male to female breakdown in terms of our staffing is 49% male and 51% female as of the end of Q2. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, you're doing well on diversity in your veterans goal. I think you're exceeding Massachusetts and locally you're, you're pretty close. And I think male, female, you're almost right on target as yes. well. And I always like to go to your website. You have 21 job postings currently, so it's still ongoing opportunities. Still opportunities to, to increase that local hire. Going on to the next slide, which is our compliance. In Q2, our security department checked 18,820 IDs at our three entrance podiums. Of those ID checks, 512 people were turned away. In breaking out those 512 individuals, 26 were minors, 129 were underage, and 355 had either expired or invalid or no IDs. There were also two fake IDs that were identified during this period. Finally, in this area, there was one minor and underage that was found on the floor. Uh, the minor was on the floor for a total of 12 minutes, uh, came through multiple entrances, did not game, nor did they consume any alcohol, and we were quick to find them and escort uh, that person and the people they were with off the floor. Any questions? I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, to see, just just so you, just in case you know, so the people who um, are turned away because they're underage or minors, what do they claim they didn't know, or they were just trying? They I say think we, Rhode Island is different age. Uh, well, I think there's a mix, and and there's also the fact that uh, the established casino in Rhode Island has a different age than we do, so there may be some people that don't have the knowledge if they're coming to try a different facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michelle. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, wanted to give you an update of our woman leading at Penn. Uh, what we did in July was we had a panel discussion where many of the women across the Penn portfolio uh, had a discussion in regards to their work-life balance. We had representation from uh, those that are married, those with children, those that are single, and uh, Kim Rigo was on the panel, so it was exciting to get to see her again. And really uh, talking about the challenges that we all face. And it was interesting to see some of these statistics now, at, uh, how we never unplug, truly unplug. And some of these stats I put up there just to share that Americans spend 171 minutes per day on their phones and an additional 90 minutes on their tablets. And uh, one of the stats that's near and dear to me is the 85% of us 
who will be on our phones while our, our children or our husbands or spouses are trying to, to speak with us. So it really, you know, sheds some light on, on what we can do and how we can make some changes. So the task that we have for homework for the group is to take a um, minute by minute of your day and write down what you do. And it, it's a big task, but in the end, the idea is to identify where the opportunity is to actually unplug for a little bit more each day. So it, it was very, uh, we learned a lot about one another, and it is things that I think we forget to be mindful of. And I like the quote on here where it says, if work-life balance exists, you must build it. And it really is our, in our control to, to do it. With, with the support of company, right? Exactly. So it sounds, did, did some of these uh, participants talk about some ways that, um, uh, you know, that could improve or just suggestions about? Yeah, I think the big one was, you know, clearly with summertime and all of us take vacations, right? right. So you're out of commission for about a week and it's making the rule to yourself that you check your email twice a day, once when you wake up mm -hmm. and once before bed, but not in between, because then it's unfair, you know, you're not getting the true vacation. So it was things like that that are very simple. You just have to teach yourself to do it and be okay with right. doing it. Yeah. Uh, again, we've had another quarter of uh, local community in, in contributions. What I want to highlight here, oh, let me change the slide, is uh, our, our Relay for Life uh, participation. So we earned about $27,000 for Relay for Life, and, and we actually helped them exceed their goal of $150,000 for this season. Uh, one of the things that we've changed this year that we didn't do in the past is we have uh, contribution boxes on the gaming floors at the exits, where a lot of times customers will have a Tito ticket for you know, 50 cents or 85 cents that they're not going to spend, they end up just stuffing it in their purse. So instead, they can put it in these contribution boxes. And since we've started it at, uh, in February, we've raised an additional $6,000 just from our guests putting in their change, essentially. Great idea. That's great. Mm. Uh, also, with sponsorships, we've continued with uh, many of the sponsorships that we typically do really um, utilizing what we have in our surrounding community for uh, entertainment destinations, uh, the uh, Fenway concert series. One of the new ones that we are doing this year, which we're all excited about, is we really wanted to try something different that we haven't done before, utilizing the outdoor racing area and the apron. So what we did is we worked with Beasley Group and we did a uh, concert series this summer. So just three concerts. The first one, you know, not a lot of people had shown up, but we realized that it really does work well in the location. And now that we have the um, venue outside of the racing area with the bar where we can serve drinks and hot dogs and burgers and whatnot. Um, so the second one we did was a, uh, which was Journey Tribute Band. And we had over 800 people come to this outdoor event. So it was very exciting. And again, it's when you're, you start to try different things that you didn't try before and they're successful. So it really opens us up to next summer to expand it and, and target that new demographic in a, in a better way. Uh, the last one is going to be in September and we're excited about it because it's uh, Brentham native uh, Ayla Brown mm -hmm. who will be performing. Oh, yeah. sure. So, so she has a following, and um, it's just something exciting to bring in a local artist. That's great. That's great. Just a few additional marketing highlights. Um, as I mentioned, the outdoor concert. We also have been really um, working on our My Choice rollout. So that is the pen-wide universal card that allows our guests to go from properties to properties. So now our portfolio is over 40 pr properties. And we're really focused on um, cross-property visitation and, and getting more people to come to this area, utilizing our, our partnerships with the uh, sports teams and with the different concerts and everything that goes on, as well as with the, um, the golf, right? So we, there's so much that we can bring people in to do. So what we did was, with the Stanley Cup, we partnered with our St. Louis property and, and kind of did a back and forth where we sent a group there and then they sent a group of their customers here. And uh, as you can see from that picture, we were all um, very excited to be promoting the Bruins. 
And um, it's unfortunate, but what, what we can do is blame Steve O'Toole because what he admitted to us is they don't win when he wears a jersey. So had he told us that, we would have asked him not to participate in the picture. There you go. <laughs> and now that we just broadcast that all across the way, that's great. It's great for Steve. Uh, I'm, <laughs> Steve, I'm, Steve will go into hiding now. Yeah, thanks. I'm actually happy to see Lance in a Bruins jersey. He looks Red very Sox next. What do we think? <laughs> So that concludes my portion of the presentation. If anyone has any questions, it looks it looks Great. everything looks strong. I think you're paying attention to all the issues and uh, all of these uh, sponsorships and local community activities are just terrific. So mm -hmm. congrats for the effort there. Thank you. As, as you know, we just gave the uh, community mitigation grant to Foxborough to work with both Plainville and Rentham to look at mm -hmm. tourism strategies to really make that part of the state and that region more of a destination. So that's all this ties into that, yeah, which is great. great. Paige has done a nice job with that. Thank you great. very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, John. Thank you. Visitors, thank you. Safe travels, Plain, Plain Ridge. Thank you very much. Appreciate your coming up and, and uh, your later morning start. Thank you. <clears throat> We're going to, I think, have one. Uh, we'll, we'll hear from Director Wells okay. before we break for lunch. Okay. That sounds good. And, thank and I don't, you. I don't think I'll be too long. I know uh, Attorney Crum is here, you know, in case there are any questions on the junket. So yeah, I aside from that, this shouldn't be um, too lengthy. Uh, Thanks again, safe travels. All right, thank you, uh, Karen. This is, uh, uh, now we have in, um, our investigations in, and Enforcement Bureau Director Karen Wells uh, addressing junket licensing and reporting requirements. Thank you. Yes, and Attorney Teresi uh, was working with me on that. She is unavailable today, but she was uh, um, collaborating with me on this, and she'll be back probably for the next meeting on this, on this issue, and she did a great job. Um, so uh, Encore Boston Harbor uh, requested some movement on using junkets uh, to bring customers into their casino. And as a preliminary matter, I just wanted to clarify for the commissioners and for the public that when we're talking about junkets in this context, we're not talking about the same thing we were talking about during the WIN and the MGM suitability determinations. We're talking about junkets in Macau. So, you know, sometimes you hear the same term, and this is a statutorily defined term, so it's how we're using it. But when we're talking about junkets in Macau, and uh, sometimes we talk about um, gaming promoters or gaming promoter rooms, those are really mini casinos within a casino. So in Macau, you'd have an individual operator running his or her own little casino, offering credit, uh, operating the games, et cetera. When we're talking about uh, junkets uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, you're really talking about almost, um, you know, like an organized tour group, like bringing people into the casino um, and uh, coordinating, uh, to sort of getting there in the rooms and everything like that. So it's not the same thing at all as what we were talking about when we were thinking about junkets in Macau. So just so that um, difference, I think, is important. Uh, so today, uh, we're looking for two things from the Commission. Uh, one, uh, the IB is asking for a determination on the level of licensure required for what I'd call an independent operator or a solo practitioner uh, junket operator. It's not someone that works for a company, an enterprise, an LLC, um, or, or the LLC or the company itself. Uh, we currently have a licensing level for a junket enterprise. That's the um, sort of that highest level BED, the uh, applicant entity form. And then employees of the enterprise or the casino itself that are working as junket operators are li would be licensed as a junket representative at that gaming employee level, the GEL form. So we kind of have a, a hole in the uh, uh, licensing levels. We'd like to know what the commission would like to do for the level of licensure for 
an independent operator, and, and Ms. Crum can explain what you know usually happens or what their expectations are at Encore Boston Harbor for that kind of uh, operator. Uh, the second thing we'll be looking for is just some feedback from the commission on the regulations. Uh, Attorney Teresi has been working on those regulations, and uh, she'd like to finish drafting those and come before you at the next meeting uh, with a version to start the promulgation process. So we wouldn't really need a vote on that, but it's helpful for the legal department to get some feedback before drafting the regulations and just saying, oh, here you go, but knowing what the policy directive is from the commission during the drafting process. So first, as to the level of licensure, I, I think to start out, if we could bring Attorney Crum up, and, and uh, uh, Assistant Director Band is also in the room. If there's any questions, he has you know 30 plus years of casino gaming experience down in New Jersey, so he can also help out sort of what their experience is there. Uh, but if Attorney Crum could explain how EBH intends to use junkets and specifically the utilization of this independent operator solo practitioner, I think that would be helpful to give you a level of comfort on what the right level of licensure should be. Good morning, Commissioners, or good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so the way we'd intend to use them is we'd enter into uh, a contract with either the entity or the individual. So essentially it would be an independent contractor uh, relationship where they'd be bringing in people. We would not allow them or, or under the regulations, nor could we permit them to uh, to give credit. So they would be essentially bringing in people, introducing them to uh, our team, uh, sort of hosting them, but uh, as independent contractors, not as employees. With, but recruiting the, them how? Yeah. Can you elaborate that a little bit? So there more? are people who operate this way. They either have businesses where they have a business enterprise, an LLC or corporation, and they employ individuals. So that would be one, one way of doing it. Uh, alternatively, there, there are individuals who we would contract with directly, and they themselves operate their own business. So I guess my question was more what types of incentives, and et cetera, drive the people in? What do they use to recruit them in if they're not giving credit? Uh, so they would, um, we would pay them commissions. But what, do they, what types of things do they offer to the clientele to get them in? They'd have to work with a host uh, at our property to much, much the same way that we work with, uh, much the same way that our host works with clients directly. They'd work with a host in our property to incentivize the client. Can you be a little more specific with me? Sure. In terms so of there's a room, comp sure. meal, that sort of thing. Oh yeah, no, there's a, a wide range of doing that. So in some instances, it's free play. Uh, in other times, it's a free meal, a hotel stay. Uh, sometimes it's uh, spa treatments. There's a large variety of comps that our hosts have available to them to provide. Okay. based on the level of play. What, what, what seems to be the, because the, we're specifically talking about the, the individual mm -hmm. representative or trip organizer, you know, a, a term junket, kind of strange. It's a bad term. It's a bad term. <laughs> yeah. um, it's in the statute. Yeah. It is, it is. You know, in government, we think a junket is something that's even more nefarious. The, um, What's kind of the, the mix of folks? I mean, you know, are they an individual, sole proprietor, LLC, this is what I do, it's my business, versus you find somebody who's involved with a large group and there's a certain contract award you pay to that individual to say, hey, bring your golf group here, what, what, right. whatever the, I'm trying to get an idea how much attention we really need to pay to these folks or if it's not a huge chunk of the business, can we just help that individual chunk and representative <laughs> go through a licensing that more resembles a vendor as opposed to a, a gaming employer or a one-time contract? I'm just trying to get a sense of what the blend is. So a lot of these individuals do this in other jurisdictions, and they have uh, essentially gaming clients that they know, that they're either very good friends with, they have a community, they've developed a uh, certain clientele. And so uh, they've got established clientele in other jurisdictions. And essentially we'd be tapping into that to have their clientele come to our jurisdiction as opposed to uh, other places. So they do tend to focus on, uh, on gaming clients. Okay, but are they a sole proprietor? Are they in, a in, established business? Or is it just somebody who does this on the side and 
they're going to get paid and you know what they get paid shows up in their taxes. Sure. Uh, so the answer is both. Some of them have established businesses where they actually have entities and they run, they run it through a business. Others of them work in different uh, fields and this is something that they do on the side as an individual. Um, could, could you share the typical arrangement with, uh, with a junket? Sure. Um, a commission base? It's uh, typically a commission base. Uh -huh. uh, we have a standard junket uh, agreement. We call it an independent contractor agreement, not a junket agreement. Uh -huh. But it is a, it's a standard uh, contractor agreement that has all the protections in it for us as well. You know, we make them go through a background check um, from our perspective as well. Right. And then so they promise to bring in a number of clients at some level of play. What if that play doesn't quite pan out, for example? I'm just curious. It's just a commission-based uh, contract, so okay. if it doesn't pan out, it doesn't pan it out. It doesn't pan out. Yeah. All right. And they're, they're under no obligation to necessarily deliver, so we're not holding them. You've got to deliver you know, X amount of people per year. Yeah. yeah. So they really resemble a lot your marketing professionals. That's right? correct. The people that you have currently on staff offering promotions, you're just leveraging the presence by using contractors are going to be doing that for you. That's correct. Mm. Yeah. I, I agree with exactly what she's saying. I've seen it where it's also been commission based and based on his, their players that they bring in as loss. They will get a percentage of that. I've seen contracts that way. But basically it's bringing the group a lot of times professional athletes. They have a following. We'll bring a whole group with them. Uh, mm -hmm. Then there's hosts that have left the business that have a large clientele base. They will do, make the same arrangements with casinos. They're just doing it privately instead of, you know, with mm -hmm. the casino they used to work. Mm -hmm. Allows them a wider range of casinos and uh, to take their clientele. So. Mm -hmm. How do other jurisdictions deal with licensing? Or obviously, you guys only operate domestically in Nevada. How does Nevada deal with? some of these independent contractors. Not, again, the established business, but the... The individuals? The professional yeah. athlete who has a following. You know, I'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure how okay. Nevada does that. Um, I, I don't think it's as highly regulated as some other jurisdictions, though. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that'd be helpful information. What, what's the level of licensure of people who uh, offer marketing uh, at... Um, the hosts? At, yeah, the hosts. Is that a GEL or a...? Well, the supervisor would be a key standard, but the, I think the line gaming. is of the game. Karen, your microphone, please. Oh, pardon me. I think the, uh, and any kind of uh, individual supervisor responsibilities would be at the uh, key gaming standard, but I think the line level employees would be at the GEL, because mm -hmm. marketing is uh, something that we definitely want to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Director Wells, you are recommending uh, key gaming employee standard uh, for this particular position. Correct. Could you just elaborate a little bit on why IEB believes that's the right standard for this position? The um, so I would say it it falls in between the gaming employee level of licensure and the type of information that we request and the. Um, key executive, which fills out the multi-jurisdictional personal history disclosure form and the Massachusetts supplement. So uh, the difference between the GEL form, the gaming employee license, the key standard, the key standard really does also take a, a dive into the finances. And given that this is uh, involved with marketing and this uh, solo practitioner would not have the supervision of an entity that's uh, licensed or the casino that's licensed. We just don't think that's quite enough of a, of a look into the finances and some of the background information. So we'd be more comfortable with that higher level of licensure. Uh, the multi-jurisdictional form itself that key employees fill out has generally the same information as the key standard form, but the key standard form is somewhat streamlined. I would say the one area where we don't ask for a lot of information that the multi-jurisdictional asks for is for uh, information on uh, relatives, uh, so the parents, children, uh, and other levels of consanguinity that are, um, that are um, asked about in the multi-jurisdictional. I don't think you really need that for this solo practitioner. Uh, but the general uh, information at that uh, at that level is captured. So, you know, we discussed it internally with, uh, uh, you know, legal and with uh, the gaming agents, and think that 
and with the licensing division, and that seems to be the appropriate level given that there's no supervision, there's no other entity or casino that's, um, that's overseeing this solo practitioner type employee, uh, well, it's not an employee, it's just the junket Contractor. operator. Mm -hmm. So that seems to give us a level of comfort because there is marketing involved in all this. I know um, in this particular position, you are concerned about finances. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding um, that the two higher level licensing background investigations both have a very strong Financial Correct, component. and they are assigned to a specific financial investigator, and there is a whole net worth analysis, tax review, that kind of thing. And given, you know, uh, Commissioner Stebbins mentioned, if, you know, if you're getting this money, you're supposed to report it on your taxes, things like that. That's the kind of thing that would be appropriate to just check that everybody's doing the right thing. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, though, a, a key gaming employee standard has to pay a thousand dollar. Oh, you know. License fee. I think, for I mean, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but okay. that may be. But I mean, correct. they're paying yeah, something. There's some kind of fee. Is is somebody who's doing this and just, again, not an official business setup? Are they going to want to go through this process and this expense to be able to, you know, offer that service to you or you know enter into that business relationship? So we have reached out to a number of the uh, well-known. Um, operators that we previously worked with, and um, we found that they are willing to participate in the process. Even if it included a fee? Because I think that's not something we're, are we contemplating charging the same? No, we, I would assume so, but you know, I'll defer to the commission on what you want to do. Well, because the charge goes back to the company, doesn't it, on the key gaming standards? That's up to the company. The, on, yes, on an employee on the, side, yeah. but yeah. obviously, if this is a uh, vendor, they would pay it all. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it would be like a you know. If we, a right. Vendor. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, 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 kind of just struggling trying to make the difference between the person who's the sole proprietor has a business set up to do this and the individual who's doesn't do this full time. One might be charged a thousand dollars. To go the key gaming employee standard route, you know, how do we treat the other one if they're? Well, the BED would be comparable, uh, right? For that application. But it's a thousand dollars renewable every year. This is a thousand dollars one-time shot. I just want to make sure we're treating everybody fairly in the license process. Well, the I'm not sure that when you, talk, when you say a year, uh, I think a key employee that's well, a key employee three pays thousand dollars once, right? No, the, for every it's renewable. It's renewable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you pay it again. Is it for a key gaming employee? I think yep. so. Standard. Yeah. Three or five years, I think. Yeah, I yep. think originally there's a whole. My understanding, and I don't know if Curtis here, but uh, that the commission, the commission had the sort of that. I, I think there was. Uh, it was five years. Five years initially, and then renewals are three years, which is by statute. The renewal time mm -hmm. is by statute, I believe. I know that because Bob DeSalvio is coming up in the new Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like Mike Mathis is coming up. And, you know, so mm -hmm. all these folks that we uh, licensed three years ago are coming up again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm comfortable with the recommendation. Uh, I, the, you know, I think it's, it strikes the uh, balance. I, I, am, I, I see the notion that um, operationally, or functionally rather, uh, these would resemble a GEL, and we do a lot of uh, a lot of investigation on the GEL, meaning the, the lower level. Uh, but as you point out, because this is a sole proprietorship that may not necessarily be within a supervisory uh, structure within the, the, the whole company, mm -hmm. you know, it, it might merit this additional uh, uh, look. I don't think going towards uh, executive or, or higher where the BED has to be filled out. Mm -hmm. Uh, really applies here in terms of the information that comes um, on that form. I, I wouldn't want that to be a, a bit of a barrier mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of getting some of these uh, people, um, you know, engaged. I think it, it helps the casino to have them uh, engaged. So, Mr. Curtis is here. Oh, if we, he just arrived. If we Did have that, clarification needs. Just be in the, in the microphone. It's five years, five years. on the microphone. 
It's five years on the initial and then three years going forward after that. Every three, three years. years renewal, correct? Yes, correct. And a thousand dollars every time they pay for the renewal. <clears throat> yes. Okay. What about the GEL? I'm just curious. GEL is three hundred dollars. Yep. And the initial is good for five years, and then the renewal is three years after that. That's three hundred dollars. Right. Right. And the executive, which we didn't talk about, but that's a thousand dollars too. Same parameters plus costs, investigative costs. Right. So what I'm hearing is that. Uh, you don't want to see the application fee become a barrier to um, engagement, but I'm not hearing any, uh, but we are, uh, I'm hearing a consensus that this is the proper uh, gaming licensing level. But can yes. we monitor then the application fee? Uh, I, I, I think what Karen is trying to do is take something we have existing and fit it to right. this That's right. unique right. individual. And at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm certainly comfortable with uh, the form she's suggesting giving her team the background and the information that they need to properly in, in investigate folks. I'm, I'm, my, ol my only challenge is balancing the individual who's just doing this as kind of a part-time thing versus somebody who this is their explicit business may not rise to the level of a junket enterprise operator, but we're treating everybody fairly and consistently. But why would that be any, any different if you're doing it as a side, part-time or full-time? If you are a sole proprietorship? Yeah, the financial risk the, the finan that the we're risk eliminating with the background is the yes. same regardless it's of their It's the same movement. regardless. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, understand. I understand. It, but it's, it's treating an individual who does this not as their primary form of business, and, unless I'm looking at the information wrong, versus somebody who does this as a sole proprietor has an established business. It doesn't rise to the level of the junket enterprise operator. I mean, if I'm a sole proprietor, I do the yeah. tours, I'm not getting to that junket enterprise level. Right. The well, enterprise comes when you begin to have employees. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and, and so, and you incorporate, you have employees, then you have, you formed a, a company, essentially, right. uh, an enterprise. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have the two levels of licensure. Right. For the company, which yeah. they would be required to fill and Correct. for the individuals, which would, they would also be required to field. But if you have a, a, a sole proprietorship, mm -hmm. just, just one person, whether they're doing it this full-time or part-time, I'd say it's the same uh, level of investigation right. that we're discussing. Yes. It, 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 it presents the same level of risk. Whether they're starting right. because they just left uh, the casino and have a, a cadre of clients that they can bring, or whether they've been doing this for many years that it's a full-time position, we would investigate and, and, and charge the same. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually, um, just through the conversation, I started thinking about the, um, the, the fee. Um, I suppose, uh, and, and, and yes, I would not want that to be a barrier, but I suppose the company could enter, could, could figure that out mm -hmm. by themselves. And figure if it is, you would either incorporate it in your arrangement or you would actually bear the cost yourself, which is essentially incorporating it or not, uh, for licensure just like you do for other employees. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, even though I did bring it up uh, through the conversation chair, I, I, I don't think um, it would be one in which we might affect the market, if you will. Uh, it would really be up to the company to figure that out. And the application fee reflects the, the really the professionalism that we're expecting through this particular position. As I understand it, there's really a gap in our regulations. We didn't uh, anticipate the solo practitioner mm -hmm. that turns out to be the model um, that that you're encountering. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I'm um, convinced that this is the right level of licensure. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and you're and we are going to address reporting stuff yeah, so okay we, it, but yeah, right. it's helpful for me to have a vote just so I'm sure that this is uh, the way to go for the licensure um, but for the reporting and all that we won't need to vote on that so it makes sense to do a vote now if you want to do that I, I would like to discuss reporting before so I don't know how oh, you, however do, you want to do it is fine with me do you want do you want you want but you do want to vote on, on just on the level of licensure not on the reporting requirements I suppose they are independent uh, to the extent, though, that in any way the reporting requirements inform your thoughts about the licensure. We can go into that discussion. 
I, I think they're, they're separate. I mean, it's, it's part of the same conversation, but I think um, solving, uh, you know, agreeing that, and it sounds like there's a consensus emerging, that the key, um, that the level of licensure is what we would anticipate. Right. Uh, I think it's fine. In, in order to um, <clears throat> advance your, your work properly, then do we have a motion with respect to the licensing level? Madam Chair, I'd be happy to move that the Commission uh, approve the recommendation of the IEB and the legal department that uh, individuals uh, operating as independent gaming representatives um, with a sole proprietorship be licensed as key gaming employees um, as more fully detailed in the memorandum from IEB Director Karen Wells. I would remove Claire. the sole proprietorship okay. um, because if you could actually choose Legal. not to LLC and still function in this way, and I think it would be the key gaming employee standard that would apply to that regardless whether you were incorporated or not. Is that correct? Well, what we would do is if the application, if the enterprise was an LLC, pursuant to the regulations that are in place, the LLC, you'd submit the BED for the LLC, but as the executive for the company, that person would fill out the key gaming standard. Like, it's a scope of licensing issue, similar to what we do with our gaming vendor primaries and gaming vendor secondaries. So, so the Commissioner Brand is correct that it doesn't necessarily apply just to the sole proprietorship. You could have someone who does not incorporate, who chooses to take the risk to not be an LLC, who could still function as an individual. Right, and that person would be the key gaming standard. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, I withdraw my motion and let me make it again. <laughs> um, I move that the Commission approve the recommendation of the IEB and the legal department that individuals operating as independent junket representatives be licensed as key gaming employees, um, as more fully described in the memorandum from Director Wells and Associate Counsel Carrie Teresi dated August 8, 2019, including in, in, included in the packet and that the IEB begin to accept um, license applications from, from uh, independent junket representatives while the Commission is promulgating regulations regarding these representatives and their reporting requirements. And that is key gaming standard. Yes. Um, right. Not exactly. Yes. Second. Okay. Any further discussion on this matter? And then we'll turn to reporting. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0, Catherine, thank you. Okay, so the second matter uh, for discussion this afternoon, um, the memo in the packet outlines what other states do as far as reporting requirements for uh, uh, casino junkets. And on page five, that is some bullet points regarding recommendations as to what should be in the regulations for reporting requirements. Those include the origin of every junket arriving at the premises, the names and addresses of participants in the junket, the arrival time and date of the junket, departure time and date of the junket, uh, the name of the li and license number of all junket representatives and junket enterprises involved in the junket, and the actual amount of complimentary services and items provided to each junket participant. Uh, this would be something that the casino would keep on file that we could uh, review if uh, uh, we so desired at any time. And in addition, the IEB is recommending requiring the licensee to submit copies of all the junket agreements to the IEB so that we can review those. Um, in addition, uh, we're also recommending that the regulations uh, prohibit both one Junkets extending credit to patrons, which Ms. Crum already indicated they have no intention of doing that anyway. And number two, uh, junkets marketing to self-excluded persons. Mm -hmm. So we've had some uh, discussion internally uh, about uh, Attorney Teresi also working with um, Mark Vanderlinden and getting his expertise on how to craft that for the commission, is, if that's the direction the commission is now uh, giving us. So it would be helpful uh, I will report back to Attorney Teresi on just sort of the, the Commission's thoughts on these parameters for the regulations, uh, the other two recommendations about credit and uh, self-exclusion, and then if there's anything else the Commission would like 
the staff to incorporate in those draft regulations, which you'll get a chance to view and change if you see appropriate, but just want to make sure we get on the right page before we give you that first draft. Yeah, I would say that your list and the two that you mentioned, particularly the self-exclusion prohibition, yeah. is important. As in terms of the last bullet, the actual amount of complementary services, I assume that means actual amount and type of complementary services, yeah. since it could come in the form of different types right. of credit. So that's right. going to be so clarified they, they in this. So they would give a list that's of what's going on. Okay. I mean, we are, we already list. have complementary reports that we make, so this would be clear what it is. Give us a quarterly report of all the complementary. Right, so not just the dollar value amount, but also yeah. the actual in-kind service. That's and those gaming right. agents do review those. It would be just, there's not a sort of a, an end run around the requirements the casino has to do. The Dunkin' operator has to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I would just, um, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm in agreement with, with the list as well as the two that you point out. I would just put up a, a finer point on the self-exclusion list. Um, there is also a no marketing list, which may actually be larger or, um, you know, a bit bigger than the self-exclusion list. I think we should, um, it should be, because it's essentially a, a marketing function um, that the um, that the, the list to check is also also include the no marketing. All right, so the uh, prohibition would include the no marketing. The no marketing list, list. not just not just the self exclusion mm -hmm. list. Um, I'm also curious, uh, Ms. Crum, uh, how um, is there any is there ever in the arrangements is there ever any kind of other um, complementary service that the junket themselves provide to the. Um, Sure, they might provide transportation. That's, uh -huh. I think, probably the most common. Um, okay. I think of anything else. Yeah. Ultimately, all of Ultimately, uh, all, it comes every, from us. everything will be will be captured by all of these lists. Right. Great. I'm fine with this. So, in reviewing other states, you really put together what you thought were best practices, and from Director Ban's uh, experience of the appropriate uh, items Correct. to take a look and at. And I think what we'll end up doing is we'll, we'll monitor this when it's in practice, but like with anything else before this commission, if we see concerns, we'll bring it back before the commission. If mm -hmm. we want to see something else or something else is you know, not mm -hmm. um, giving us the same level of comfort as we should have, then we can always revisit it. So it's not as if a one and done situation where you do this now and six years from now you can't undo it. We, we'll, we'll let you know if we have any concerns. I just wanted to, to clarify uh, the point that we discussed, uh, Director Wells, is that the IEB will receive a copy of each junket agreement, including those with the, the solo practitioners, um, and then the other information will not flow directly to IEB, those that are put forth in the, the, the bullets. Uh, but you, in, through IEB, occasionally audit this kind of information. Right. And inspect on site. And, and, yeah. and am I hearing, too, that we, get, we would get in the quarterly report that the complementary services? From, from all the licensees. And that would include here. So that information does flow directly to the IEB through a quarterly report. That's helpful to know. Right. And you're not looking for any further guidance in a, in a vote? Yeah. or No, this? just if, if there were any other bullet points, any other things you wanted us to add that we hadn't thought about, want to make sure we incorporate that. If you're in agreement with the um, parameters that have been set here, that's what uh, the legal department will put into the regulations and we'll bring that, I think, at the next meeting. That's, that's great. The, the one um, item is that we have now authorized uh, you to proceed with this um, licensing level in effect. I think it's always best. Uh, this would be a matter of policy for enforceability. A regulation would be great, so we would proceed in through the normal course of, of a, a regulatory promulgation, uh, but keeping it on uh, on a good cadence going forward. Exactly. Yeah, and I would, while she couldn't be here today, I'd like to thank Associate General Counsel Teresi for all the work she did on yeah, Director Wells did mention it and, and, and said that she had done an excellent job. So we miss, we're we missing Carrie today, but understand her, her work. So thank you. And so, Jackie, all this information in this list is readily available, can be produced in reports. It's not going to be onerous to... No, we can produce all that information readily. Yep. Thank you. All right. I'm fine. Okay. 
Thank you very much. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I believe that this is probably a good time for all of us to grab a bite to eat, and we'll resume. It is now 1.30. Uh, this 2.15 seem too generous? 2.15 two seems, would you prefer two? Do you have? That's fine. Two, two would work uh, for us if that works for all. Okay, thank you. We'll re resume back at 2 p.m. We're reconvening our public meeting, number 275. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna start now with item number five on our agenda. Uh, thank you, the Research and Responsible Gaming Report from Director Mark Vinderlinden. Great, thank you, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so what I'm bringing before you today is um, the FY20 gaming research agenda, um, and I will ask your, for your, your guidance and um, hopefully a, a vote um, affirming this agenda. Uh, uh, Chapter 23K, Section 71, directs the Massachusetts Gaming Commission with the advice of the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee to carry out an annual research agenda. There are three core functions of what the research agenda is intended to accomplish. One is to broadly understand the social and economic effects of expanded gaming in Massachusetts. Uh, second is to carry out a study of problem gambling and existing prevention and treatment programs in Massachusetts that address its harmful results before any casinos open up in Massachusetts. And then finally, and this is also rather broad, um, collecting scientific information about the neuroscience, psychology, sociology, and public health impacts of gambling. The research funded under the Expanded Gaming Act is important um, to fully understand the effects of expanded gaming in, in the Commonwealth. And more importantly, the findings are intended to guide the development of interventions and policies that maximize the, the positive impacts of gambling in Massachusetts and at the same time function to minimize uh, gambling-related harm. The memo that I'm giving you has, um, has, has several pieces to it um, under the, the FY20 research plan. One is a general description of each project that would be included in this plan. Second is the very specific deliverables and activities that are included. And finally, there's a reference to the section of 23K, um, which the, the deliverable uh, relates to. Oh, and um, as well as a, finally a, a budget review of what the FY20 research um, will cost. Um, the FY20 plan begins to integrate um, the, uh, the gaming research strategy that um, was, was um, conducted or completed over the past probably about a year and a half right now. Um, that research strategy was, was I think an essential component, much as the um, Responsible Gaming Framework has guided the Commission in its efforts um, regarding responsible gaming, this gaming research strategy will, will provide the same. This strategy is a multi-year um, uh, um, document that will provide us with valuable information about how to change it not from a research agenda to a research program. Um, it highlights key um, areas in which we haven't necessarily focused on in the past, but um, are important for us to, if we really want to accomplish this overall goal of understanding the effects of gambling in Massachusetts, it integrates some important pieces of that. Um, and finally, it does, uh, it, it really calls upon us to do a, to, to um, get the information out to the important stakeholders um, in a timely manner which is a challenge of any research, but this concept of knowledge translation, that is taking the, the mountain of data that we have 
and maximizing its utility to key stakeholders so they can make an informed, <laughs> much like we ask for, our, for gamblers in Massachusetts, make an informed um, choice or informed decision that is based on, on evidence rather than on, on feelings and, and anecdotes. Um, the research agenda, um, <laughs> this FY20 research agenda was uh, approved by the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee in May, on May 22nd. I brought it to the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee on July 11th um, with no recommendations for, for changes at that time. Um, the Gaming Policy Advisory, or, or, I'm sorry, the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee did approve this, this budget or this research plan um, in May. Um, the total cost of this uh, um, research plan for fiscal year 2020 is $2,350,000. Um, that uh, is $130,000 less than the FY19 approved budget and $230,000 less than the FY18 approved budget for, for research specifically. Um, the, the exact, uh, the more detailed budget and the cost for each deliverable or, or for each project, I should say, is, is on page five of the memo that you have. So on page two, from page two to four, really, it, it outlines, as I said, each of the, the specific deliverables, um, the tasks that are involved in, in that deliverable, and the statutory and practical significance. Um, I, uh, my, I can go through each, each of these deliverables or I can talk to you just be, um, kind of generally about what the significance and importance of each of the projects that we have, have are. Um, why don't I do that and then if you have specific questions we can, we can dive into that. So on the top of page 2A, um, you can see that we have uh, six months worth of work outlined with the uh, Sigma team from, from UMass Amherst. Um, that's only a, a six-month plan because um, from January 1st to June 30th, the second half of this fiscal year, we have this work out for re-procurement at this point. Um, and so the exact work um, largely will be defined um, through this, this procurement process. Um, there are a number of deliverables that um, are coming our way in the first six months. Um, because of the nature that this is an ongoing, had been an ongoing project, um, we have a lot of deliverables in this first six months where we're, we're being delivered the data um, and that it would be intended that the successful bidder um, would take that data and, and begin integrating it into their work. So for example, um, an important task in the, in the coming month or two will be the Springfield Targeted Survey. Um, this is a, a survey of a thousand um, individuals in the in the Springfield area, adult individuals, I should say, using address-based sampling design um, that builds on a baseline that was done before MGM Springfield opened up. The significance of this is to try to get a a handle and understanding of what changes have happened when you open up a, the MGM casino in Springfield. What are the changes with gambling behavior, participation, attitudes, um, and importantly, what are the changes in, in problem and at-risk gambling? Um, that information is valuable because um, obviously we take that information and it begins the basis of what is our public health, um, what is our public health approach or strategy to address that. And that is done in, in partnership with um, our partners at the um, Department of Public Health and other state agencies. Mark, just so I understand, again, this is just for, uh, raw data that will be collected by our current uh, researcher, UMass. Yes. And the RFP goes out, and this data that's being collected, when you issued the RFP, <coughs> was part of the, the expectations for the response that the ability of the respondents, uh, uh, respondents' ability to actually use this data, or do we just assume that they can use that data? Is it universal research standards, or was it specific to the RFP uh, on all of these deliverables? Yeah, so we, we own the data that is collected. Yeah. It's uh, by contract. We, we, um, it, is, it is our data, and so that data then um, would be transferred to the, uh, 
So I understand the ownership, but in, because I, I'm, I'm not an academic or a researcher, <clears throat> how the, rate, the data is collected, or because it's simply raw data, it will be the data that will be acceptable to whoever actually is awarded the RFP? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. There is also, <clears throat> in case other respondents are interested, there is also, they would have access not just to all the data, but all the, mo the model that's, you know, that's underneath to calculate, you know, the algorithms that, that are underneath to, to calculate incidents, for example. So there's, there's, it's not just data. It's, there's also methodology. The methodology, that's, that's that, really the better way. Thank yeah, you, that helps. That also, that also you know, allows anybody to respond who wants to take this on. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Um, and so you'll see that, that a lot of these activities in the first half of um, the year that will be carried out by UMass are focusing on the Springfield and, and surrounding areas <laughs> to understand what the, what the impacts are. Um, and that includes the MGM patron and license plate survey. So, for example, they've, they've been to, the research team has been to MGM um, in two waves at this point, one uh, back in February and then again um, last month. So they have this, this data um, and they will be, be reporting on that. Um, that is in, in valuable information because it begins to answer questions about what is the origin of the patrons that come to the <coughs> casino um, and it answers key questions uh, about um, repatriation of dollars coming to to Massachusetts, or um, or bringing uh, persons from outside of Massachusetts um, in to to Massachusetts to spend their their dollars gambling. Um, it includes the uh, a new employee survey, um, which uh, uh, for um, for MGM as well as PPC and and Encore, um, the Encore construction report. Um, that this would be another example where we would, they, the Sigma team is collecting the data, they will organize it, um, um, the analysis and construction spending impacts will be um, done through the, through the re-procurement. Um, so, sorry sorry and, to interrupt again. Yes. In terms of the new employee survey, we discussed this a little bit. I'm not sure how we left it though, Mark. <coughs> I understand that there, that the idea is to, uh, to to understand better the economic impacts on the individual employee, and so you're getting kind of baseline information on the new employee, and will there be an opportunity to be able to survey those new employees who continue on in service to find out if if their anticipated uh, impacts actually come to fruition. Will, will that become part of the agenda, do you think, down the road? So and that we could yeah. actually... So we can track employees track down from... the economic impact on the individual right, employee. From when they're hired all the way through. Right, because this is... Uh, you're doing a new employee survey now at MGM. You probably did one before on the mm -hmm. first round. Yeah. Now the new... Yeah. And so I'm just wondering if we could track, particularly if we've done it... Have we started at Encore doing the new employees? Yes, we have. There's an opportunity to maybe start tracking there. Right. Um, if I could get back to you with an answer on that, I know that there are complications of, of tracking these employees over time, and I don't want to give you um, a wrong answer. I would, I would yeah. love to say absolutely we're tracking them over time, but I want to understand understand that completely from our because from of our privacy research. issues, et cetera. Right. Yeah, and well, we have not done a repeat of the same. Um, licensee on the employee survey. What you articulated is essentially we're, we're coming on the employee survey now on the third time around, but only because it's the third casino. Um, actually, this is a good thought to, to have in terms of future research agenda, not the one before us, relative to how much follow-up of a prior employee survey should be done in the in uh, in the facility, um, you know. I think I think it's 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 good. It's important. There's a high turnover uh, in the industry. Uh, that you know, it's in my mind, it's good to um, to see the trend. They they tell us that 
those very high turnovers um, decrease over time, and that's that would be a testament to a good um, operation in terms of people. But um, but we have not yet planned, at least at this point. Correct me if I'm wrong. A follow-up survey on, let's say, Plainbridge on the employees. It, correct. It has not been. We, we have not planned that. It's 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 a good it's a good thought to to, and, to keep in mind for the Mark, future. Yeah, Mark is reminding me of, of how we left it that there is potentially some some barriers, legal barriers to getting that kind of information. Right. To the extent that there aren't barriers, it might be helpful to know how, in fact, um, being an employee at one of our licensed facilities impacts them economically. One presumes favorably if they're staying. But that may not necessarily be the case. Mm -hmm. So just the economic impacts in terms of how you measure. measure. Right. I think that, that follow-up is, it, and Commissioner Stebbins and I have, have spoken about this in the past, too. Um, you know, it, it, it does collect information about what, what was the person doing just before they started working at the casino. Were they unemployed? Were they underemployed? Um, what was their motivation to, um, to seek a job specifically at the casino? Um, a lot of people say it was the excitement and the idea of working working in a in a casino. Um, it would be interesting to see if if that remains true for them um, one year out. I think the, that's a fantastic question. Um, I can I can follow up with what are the potential barriers of of doing that, um, and perhaps that's something that that through this next phase of of the research can be a, a focus um, in moving forward. I, th I think there's also some coordination with Jill and how she's trying to format reporting mechanisms from our licensees as to breaking people out by senior level management, mm -hmm. mid management, yeah. line level. And, you know, right now I think to Enrique's point, they're kind of snapshots because we're still in kind of some turnover period. But I think you could track diversity in those ranks, see if there are numbers moving up. Mm -hmm. um, but looking Promotions. at how those numbers stabilize a little bit. Uh, but you know, without again immersing ourselves in trying to get it, you know, get to the individual, which I agree would be helpful because it does help uh, us better understand why somebody might have stuck with the job or left the job or what they enjoy mm -hmm. about the job. Uh, I actually, but aligning yeah. those two pieces. Yeah, might and even be even more fundamentally, um, Commissioner Stebbins, I was thinking, you know, maybe shift work accommodates childcare costs in a way that they, their earlier jobs didn't. So therefore, mm -hmm. it's actually an economic impact. I am able to save more because my spouse is able to be home at nighttime while I do a night shift because I didn't have that opportunity in my prior job. Just those kinds of childcare costs, transportation costs. Uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 is, is there an advantage or, or a disadvantage? They, they may say I'm getting promotions, um, but the, the costs are, are still actually staying high so that I don't really feel the advantage of the increased salary, mm -hmm. although I feel career advancement. Who knows? But just something to think yeah. about. Yeah. No, this is a great conversation to have to, to get uh, a handle on what's what's important for the commission to understand, too. So um, I will report back. Um, so moving on to the, the next uh, project would be uh, the Massachusetts Gaming Impact Cohort. Um, this is a project that was funded by the commission back in 2014, I believe, 14 or 15. Um, we are in this uh, in the next year, so this will be a 12-month um, uh, a 12-month project that will be conducting uh, Wave Six data collection. So again, the cohort is is following the same groups a group of individuals over the course of time to begin understanding what is a change of in, in their in their gambling behavior. Um, the unique part about the the Massachusetts Gaming Impact Cohort is that it is oversampled with um, individuals that would be considered at risk or problem gamblers. Um, this is, a, to me, um, one of the more important projects that, that we are doing right now um, because it contributes to an understanding what are the predictors of, 
of risky gambling? What are the predictors of, of problem or disordered gambling? Um, and that information is, is incredibly valuable when you're considering policy and practice um, uh, um, implications. Um, so we are expecting wave, wave three, the wave three report to come before the commission um, in the next uh, uh, very, very soon. So um, that means that um, waves four, and wave four actually is going to be shortly behind that one um, in terms of a deliver deliverable that's coming to the commission and wave five is under analysis right now. Um, moving on to the public safety research. Um, again, this is, as you know, this is our, our work with crime analyst Christopher Bruce. Um, he has, he's juggling a number of different projects right now, including um, the MGM um, eight month um, public safety impact report. So that's building on the four month report that was presented to the commission, as well as the baseline. Um, he is also uh, finishing up work and is in the analysis and writing up of the Encore or Everett um, baseline report, looking at um, approximately five years worth of public safety data prior to the opening of, of Encore, as well as the, uh, the year four Plain Ridge Park Casino report. So um, he never um, ceases to amaze me what what he's able to do with the limited time that, that we have him um, and the, the quality of work that he does. <coughs> um, risk of asking another a question. No, that's, that's um, great. I know that he does have a lot on his plate, but I'm wondering if, if uh, we have a, a more definite timeline on any of these deliverables. For instance, do you think we'd have that baseline study for our encore meeting, which is scheduled September 12th, by chance, just their, their yeah. quarterly report, or are we anticipating yeah. that or no? So um, we're running into some, uh, as he has a lot on his plate, we're running yeah. into some coordination and logistical challenges with, with Christopher. Um, he has assumed a, a teaching position in, at a university in Maine, um, and September is, is a tough time for him. Um, the work that he produces for us is, is incredibly valuable. We want to we want to retain that and respect the, the balance. So at this point, we're hoping for our meeting with the uh, police chiefs of Everett and the surrounding communities sometime at the very beginning of October. Um, and then after th at the same time, that report will go through our research review committee so that we would be able to if everything moves as predicted, we would have that later in the month of October. I think um, we're going to get him in here for several days in October in which, using that time wisely, we have meetings scheduled or about to be scheduled with um, the surrounding communities in Springfield, the surrounding mm -hmm. communities in Everett, the surrounding communities in Plainville, and, and an additional meeting on trafficking. Um, so we have him in for four different meetings and just trying to figure out do we have him in two days at a time so we're, we've been working on that now for a number of days um, so we think that's his best our best use and his best use of time um, and then we will shortly after that I mean I think all his work will be done but those meetings just to make sure the chiefs are comfortable mm -hmm. um, the trafficking is different because that's much more of a um, uh, an initial kind of a kickoff uh, right. uh, thing. So um, I think October is a better time frame. Is there one that you anticipate being first? Uh, 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 is it going to be Plain Ridge or Encore? You don't know yet. Well, it's almost, you know, a part of the issue was um, summer vacations, getting, yeah, sure. getting folks uh, available. So I think it'll depend on who how many chiefs we can get at which meeting at what so, time so it's really driven by that as opposed to it, it, it is it. it is okay. and um uh, you know do we, do we need them twice or can we do all of those four meetings in a couple of days mm -hmm. and be on the road for a couple of days right. so we're working out those details he did send us his whole availability so it's it's coming quickly um and then right right after those meetings we should be able to present because I say the, the work is done, it's just those final meetings that need to happen. 
and, and right on the heels of that is he begins working then on, on the next report, specifically, especially for um, oh. NGM and, and Encore. And Encore will be its initial three-month report or yeah. four-month Yeah, you know, report? it ended up being a four-month report mm -hmm. for MGM, um, just the way that it worked out. Um, the, the intention is to get a snapshot of what happened right after um, the casino opened. Um, and then, and especially if you think about, are there any issues out of the gate that the commission or the local law enforcement need to, to really be paying attention to that, um, that are data driven? Great. great. It's great work. So we're looking forward to getting it. Yeah, I am too. You, you know, I mean, the, it's, it's the, the tension between um, getting the data as, as timely as we possibly can get it and at the same time have the rigor and our method uh, uh, give our give our researchers the, the kind of the breathing room to do do it right and the rigor of the review process and um, I have to say in the six the six years that I've been working here that is the tension that, that um, we experience on almost every single deliverable um, and uh, um, what what I can stand by is is the the findings and the the results that are presented to you um, and to others that we can really stand behind um, those findings. And you know, Christopher is very good. Is, is if he sees something in real time, he will report that. So we're not waiting four months to find out if there's something that needs immediate attention. So that piece is, is very valuable from a public safety standpoint. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that clarification. It's important. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, so then uh, moving on to the community engaged uh, research arm of the research program, let's call it now. Um, so we, uh, the community engaged research is to more deeply understand and address the impacts of the introduction of casino gambling. The topic or issue that um, is researched is driven by the community, so it would be a question that, that the community would have. We hold on to the same um, research rigor, um, so while it's driven by the community, we, um, we expect there to be a connection um, with uh, a research team in order to, to, um, to carry out the, the actual research. Um, great examples of that, of research that's been done to date. Um, is work that we uh, did with the Bedford VA, a report that was generated from that um, work um, that was driven by um, an agency called JSI looking at um, African American perspectives on gambling in different regions of the state. And finally, a, a research deliverable that was just complete and I hope to bring to the commission is looking at gambling behavior among um, persons who live in the Boston Chinatown neighborhood um, and, and specifically more shift workers um, that, that work in that, in that neighborhood. In fiscal year 19, we awarded three new contracts, um, one that is looking at the Hispanic and Latino communities in Greater Springfield, um, going back and funding additional research um, in the Boston Chinatown neighborhood with funding to the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Association, and looking at um, gambling behavior and impacts among older adults, that research being led by the Mass Council on Compulsive Gambling in cooperation or in partnership with a local um, agency serving older adults in, in the southeastern part of the state. Um, this is great, great research. I think it's a great complement to, uh, to the broader research that, that's being carried out by, at this point, by our Sigma team but this sort of statewide um, and regional approach. I think that it's really important to have, have those types of questions come up and for us to be able to have a funding mechanism to answer questions from local communities. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, let me spend a minute, that's a great summary, but let me just spend a minute to add to that um, because even though there's been already some research emerging out of that process, it's a fairly new uh, in our in the arc of our research uh, project here, it's a fairly new aspect, one that the strategic plan, which is also in the packet, identifies um, as a key feature of where we should be going with um, more you know, community input, not just a group of researchers or commissioners coming up with what should be studied, 
that's fine, but there's a big supplement, which is what is the community really interested in learning or debunking or verifying. Um, not only that, there's usually, and the three studies that you mentioned and the ones that we will be seeing, also get to something that the big surveys don't quite get to, and those are things more on the qualitative side of, um, um, you know, of different groups, how different groups are affected differently, which again was the genesis of these three subgroups uh, to begin with. The, the, the very early, um, the big baseline study, uh, we were not able to ascertain too much about certain groups because of the sampling size. So there was a lot of questions relative to margin of error and whatnot. Um, with funding this type of research for different groups, allow us to really begin to at least understand why are some communities hard to reach from uh, about surveys or what aspects do they, how they think about gambling and whatnot. So um, as, you, as you correctly say, it's a great supplement. Mm -hmm. It's one that I think we should continue as the years progress, um, we should see a little bit more of. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next um, element of the, the research program is the Data Transfer Storage and Access Project, and this is something that we've been working on for quite some time. Uh, how do this, this could, it relates, I feel like, to some of the knowledge, knowledge um, translation work that let's, we have, we, we, we have amassed a lot of data um, through this research program, through this commitment that the Gaming Commission has made, um, let's 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 continue to maximize that. Let's make sure that that individuals, researchers, have access to that data so they can do their own analyses, and um, and it only strengthens our our research program and strengthens strengthens the field um, that just by just does not have a lot of funding to it. So we we have a, we have a great resource here. And it's trying to figure out a system which we we protect the data that we have, but at the same time, make sure that it's available for research purposes. Um, this also um, fits in another thing, piece that fits under this would be the Section 97 data. That's a it's a, re a statutory requirement that we gather um, player card data and actual play behavior from um, each of the casinos, and that in turn becomes um, accessible for researchers for research purposes. Um, this is a, a project that we've been um, in partnership with the Department of Public Health on. Um, they have the types of safeguards and, and mechanisms in place to assure the, the safety of, of this data. Um, and again, much like we want to make sure that the, the findings that we have are solid, we want to make sure the data that we have is protected. Um, and the final piece of it is research review, um, a, a group that I could not, um, we, we could not assure the quality of the research that we have without this, um, without a committee that um, independently reviews the, the deliverables that come to my inbox, um, asking them, um, a very highly qualified group, um, to, to review, provide feedback um, and guidance to our research teams. That's the sort of the final step before we release it to, to um, before we release it publicly. So that is the FY20 research plan. Um, it, uh, I believe, as you can see, um, relates and supports the statute. It's guided by um, the gaming research strategy. Um, and it builds upon some of the, the amazing work that has been done to date um, in Massachusetts re around gaming research. And it, uh, I think you may have alluded to it at least, or perhaps um, certainly from the, from the memo here, you can derive that, um, as you uh, will remember, we're going through a procurement of this, uh, uh, the Sigma portion, um, which um, completed its sixth year on their contract uh, recently. Um, a couple of the activities highlighted here are effectively the tail end of those deliverables. Uh, some of the funding here is reserved for um, whomever 
picks up that part of the project, um, depending on the respondents, um, et cetera. And there's other aspects that are not being reprocured, notably the MAGIC uh, project, which mm -hmm. again you highlighted here, some of the other, uh, because that is under a different um, time frame. It might be reprocured at a later time, or next year, perhaps. Um, same with some of the other um, community-driven uh, research and whatnot. So I just wanted to highlight that for your mm -hmm. clarification. Mark, I, th I, I like everything you've walked through. Um, I think what's interesting is you look at your strategy, which you also included for us, and the great work that went into that. Um, what's interesting to me is watching how, I think you even refer to it as, driving the knowledge out to other stakeholders, other people that can utilize the information. Right. Um, I think there are a lot of components, you know, the patron survey, um, you know, the new employee survey. Um, there's a lot there that I think would be of value to the local tourism bureaus, local economic development officials. I think even if you get to, you know, some of the public safety stuff that I know Commissioner Cameron tracks sharing that information actually with our local community mitigation advisory committees so they can begin to think about guidelines and uh, steps to take with the community mitigation funds use. I think all that is, it's, it's doing the research, but as you point out, it's just as important to share that information out to the number of stakeholders that want to see it as well. Right. Um. I should note that not in this document, but quite possibly for next year, next fiscal year, uh, or perhaps, well, yeah, quite possibly next fiscal year, we should be thinking about the redo of the big general population survey, mm -hmm. um, which is it's, it's just a coming attraction, if you will. That will certainly have a big cost component uh, if it's somewhat similar to what we did um, last, the first time around, mm -hmm. um, but we will ascertain all of that with uh, um, with some of the results that we get from that procurement that we are doing. Mm -hmm. I think. Um the recommendations are appropriate. The research planned is uh, certainly in keeping with following um, following what we've done, but obviously looking to improve at every every step. Yeah. Makes sense to me. You need a motion to approve this? I do. Yes. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I'd move that the Commission approve the FY uh, 2020 research plan as described in the memo uh, from Director of Research and Responsible Gaming Mark Vanderlyn and dated 8-15-2019 included in the Commission pack. Is there a second? Second. Any further questions, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank very, you. very Thank helpful. You. And uh, I have, I have some follow up. I will, I will be presenting back to you. So. We are moving on to item six on the agenda: the administrative update. A little out of order today. Um, All Mr. good. Bedrosian, thank so you. thank you for hanging in there. No problem. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Um, I will not be all that long. Might be good news. Um, but uh, Commissioner Stebbins had asked at a um, agenda setting meeting for an update on racing. And I think you all know this, but let me give you the details. On August 1st, the legislature passed Chapter 47 of the Acts of 2019, which extended the current horse racing and wagering statutes, general laws 128 and C until January 15th, 
2020. The good news was that on that particular day, August 1st, there was no disruption in racing or simulcasting, either a PPC or for simulcasting any of our other licensed simulcasting um, venues. Uh, that, those acts, Chapter 47 of 2019, extended the current legislation in its form with one exception, and that's the exception that Suffolk Downs hold a live racing day 1 to 50 in order to simulcast. Um, that requirement was deleted. Otherwise, all at other aspects of the racing uh, remained intact, and which um, will stay that way until January 15th, unless the legislature happens to do something before then. Which does mean, which does mean, and I might be anticipating something here, sure. that applications for next year will be due by October 1st, with action by the commission by on on or by by November 15th, 2019, this year. So, little bit of a um, interesting situation, because people, if they decide to put in racing applications, obviously PPC, we would assume, would. Um, whether there will be other folks doing that, um, we have yet to see. I think we have done something in the past where we did a, the commission thought about a placeholder yes. status. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, these are things we need to think about. Um, we um, uh, might get a little more granular as that date gets closer. Um, in the meantime, uh, we will work with the commission and staff to think about how we can help the legislature in their responsibilities in the fall. We will want to uh, do everything we can to participate in that process. And one of the proposals did ask for that, and it just uh, didn't end up in the final. So exactly. I think that's really responsive. I yes. think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the requirement of the holding one day of live racing to continue simulcasting um, is no longer in the in this new. In the extension, in is the no extension longer. till so January 15. So Suffolk Downs could technically simulcast between January 1 and January 15. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So it's, uh, and it's a, okay. it, it, it's a it, right now it's basically a two-week period a at two which period. at the end of it right. there's, again, will have to be some type of legislative action, presumably. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, <laughs> there's no live racing in January 15. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right if now we have not yeah, exactly. Anyway. Um, anyway, it will only be simulcasting who might be interrupted if the legislature decided not to act until the last day, correct? Mm -hmm or even after. Sure. The legislature did request information um, pertaining to um, employment numbers associated with simulcasting. I don't know if all the commissioners received that, but uh, that's not lost on the legislature that with sim am I saying, yeah, simulcasting, <coughs> I kept on saying uh, uh, syndication the other day, simulcasting, uh, there are jobs associated, and I think it was over 200, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was broken down to part-time and, right. and, and full-time, but yeah, between the three facilities, we say, or two facilities? Three facilities, right. right. Um, so there was... Yeah, there was just, and, yeah. and PPC, okay. correct. And PPC. Mm -hmm. Well, and, 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 and then there's, there's also the, all the live racing um, at PPC jobs that mm -hmm. somehow get a little bit lost in the shuffle, in my opinion, uh, because everybody's thinking about, you know, Suffolk Downs, right. but when, um, or, or might be, but, you know, the, the, the disruption comes also to Plainbridge, um, if this was to be, I don't know, let, let it expire or, or what have you. Sure, absolutely. I, I think the chair made a good point about, you know, the, the one of the versions had asked for impact on simulcasting, even though that was stripped out, I would still like to see us be proactive and share that information back. We've never shied away from communicating with the legislature. Information we felt was valuable, you know, the employment as well as taxes and everything else. There's a financial piece to this that impacts not only just the Commonwealth, but some of the communities. Um, and I, I don't think we should hesitate or shy away from giving another push to the horse racing bill that we've put in front of the uh, legislature on a number of occasions to 
again, we don't want this industry to be forgotten or uh, lost at this point. I think you made a great point. We'll see what we get for applications, but I'd prefer to us to maybe be a little more proactive and a little less reactionary and following up on you know the impact on simulcasting would be a great way to push some information out there for the benefit of the lawmakers to make the appropriate decisions. And, yeah, and, 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 and to be clear, during the last several months, there was a lot of um, very well coordinated communications up to the legislature mm -hmm. uh, through our office and uh, through the good work of John Ziamba and others, Catherine, others. Um, <clears throat> and, and with respect to the legislative process, and the calendar, uh, the decision making did come very, very late. However, we did communicate our, our concerns and they were received and I think they were graciously received. I think they appreciated the input from the Gaming Commission. Uh, and, and I um, would say that we had full cooperation from the governor's office at that, at that last hour. Uh, to, so that we could make sure Catherine was able to provide important guidance at the end to know what time um, was critical. So as much as the, it, it did seem very last minute, it, and it was for our folks, there is a lot of magic that goes on in the legislature that I suspect uh, many of us will never understand. But the good news is it didn't impact horse racing right for this year. And so I only say that because I want to make sure, given our ability to communicate together right now, that you know, John and Catherine were making calls continuously. Ed was involved. And they were, we were um, working to make sure that, uh, and with Alex, of course, she's not here, she's on vacation, was to make sure that we could um, preserve that racing day. Gail, of course, was informed as well. You know, on, on, on that note, um, is there, you, you were mentioning, Commissioner uh, Stebbins, the uh, notion of, um, you know, the, you called it, I guess, the, the, what, the, the bill or the, yeah, the, what we proposed or we pushed, uh, if you will. Um, I, I'll remind everybody that, you know, we were required to do that by statute, by the original uh, 23K. Uh, we're, supposed to look then and recommend uh, improvements to um, both the, the live racing and the simulcasting statutes. We, we proposed 128D, if I remember correctly. Um, I wonder if there, if, if, if there would be, or if, if in your conversations, or if, if they would be beneficial for, to have those conversations with that context, that after all these one-year extensions, it occurs to me that the original um, proposal that would fix um, or give us the discretion uh, to, to, to fix all the moving pieces of the history of the gaming, of the racing statutes, I, I, I wonder if that's getting enough attention. Uh, my guess is that it's not when it comes down to the last week or days, um, but my hope is that now with a few months um, that we could have you know, that reminder or those discussions to say, here's the broader context, here's the research that we did, here's where we proposed uh, the certain things, that you simplify all these takeouts into one, that you uh, do, do, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to things like well, what are the jobs that are associated with this industry, to, you know, to hopefully have a shot at um, something that would be more of a permanent fix I rather do, than, yeah. than, a, than a and I and I um, so I, I uh, do believe that we should approach this in a in a comprehensive and strategic fashion. And I, Gail has taken the leadership on horse racing, and I'm hoping that she'll continue to do that in conjunction with the executive staff. Uh, and I think that uh, the goal is to use these next several months in the fall uh, to to help. Um, inform the legislature and others who are stakeholders of at least what we think might be helpful. And again, without getting over our skis too quickly and too much, uh, work work with those stakeholders to, to be helpful, but also advocate. As, um, I appreciate that we have real interest in preserving this industry and preserving these jobs, both 
uh, with respect to all jobs that are associated with horse racing. So I think that Gail, uh, you know, I'm kind of m remembering her original assignment on horse racing, and we just actually spoke briefly this morning about it, but she'll continue with her leadership role and will stay on a good timeline because time is short now. And I think uh, to all the points, it may be worth uh, for executive staff also reviewing that legislation. That's I mean, right. I think that was certainly right. during mm -hmm. a different commission makeup. Yep. And also the context might have changed slightly, right? You know, um, if we had legislation, and I'm not saying our legislation isn't that agile, but, you know, the Horse Race Development Fund may be one of those issues the legislature wants to address. How does our legislation necessarily deal with that? Does it presuppose a certain funding or not? We just, I think, I don't, I'm not talking about major changes. I think I'm talking about tinkering and yeah. just making sure we're all okay. So it might be worth at one of our meetings in September and October, staff um, bringing back to the commission and saying, hey, are we, is this exactly what you think yeah, would be a yeah, good idea? Absolutely. There's, there's definitely uh, assumptions that we may have made then that should be revised or rethought uh, or new ones. Uh, but my point is that, you know, I, I, it would be uh, too, pity, too much of a pity if we find ourselves in January 10th, let's say, uh, in a similar situation. No. Um, and I'm not suggesting that it would be for lack of anybody here trying. I'm suggesting and agreeing with many of the points made here, especially you, Commissioner, about being proactive towards, um, you know, informing what what I know to be a very complex history of legislative history in all these live racing and simulcasting statutes. And, um, and what I see only from the proposed legislation, even though a lot of it ultimately fails, of what the thinking may be up there. Uh, that you know, they may be thinking, well, maybe there's a balance from the Race Horse Development Fund. Could we use it somewhere else? Um, I think to the extent that we could, we should explain what it was first designed to do, what it might not be doing, and what it is in fact doing, okay. among other things. No, good, good point, and um, it's not just our bill, there are a number of bills uh, that the legislature now has given themselves time to deal with, and we will support uh, in every way possible uh, getting information if we think it's important or responding when they make requests. So um, right. there, I know there are a number of factors that could change the landscape. We just don't know, but the legislature now has time and um, we, will, we will serve in that role, I think, as effectively as we possibly can. And again, with, under a, a, a strict timeline, and then we'll find out what happens in January, but we should at least be as helpful as possible. So it was excellent that Commissioner Stebbins asked for that update, and we'll proceed, but probably uh, on a regular basis, get updates as to where we are positioning in terms of timeline. So thank you. That is my short update. <laughs> Nothing thank else. You. Do we have any other questions for uh, Director Bedrosian at this time? Anything coming up or in terms of, that you would want him focused on? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're moving on to our minutes. We really are in reverse order today. Uh, Madam Chair, in your packet you have the uh, minutes from the meeting, uh, the full commission meeting on July 18th, 2019. I'd move for their approval, as always subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Um, the only comment I had was um, at the bottom of page 13, the discussion of the Hamden County District Attorney's Office. I did mention, and I'd, I'd like that to be emphasized, that I wanted a meeting with the MDAA and the various uh, DA office stakeholders to work together uh, when they're developing the system for tracking the cases. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say what that acronym is? Uh, the MDA is the Mass District Attorneys Association. I just had one. Oh, did you have one? No, I, I just was Go recalling that conversation, and I actually answered my so, <laughs> so we're good. I was going to ask you a question about that, but then I recall that exact discussion. So it makes sense. 
And on the uh, page 12 and 13, I think it's just a matter of um, placement in terms of order. On the end of mm -hmm. um, the last paragraph at the bottom of page 12, mm -hmm. it mentions that um, I noted that I was singularly situated and that it does say I'm not likely to support the motion, but the motion hadn't been made. And I mean, I, I, the motion had been made by Commissioner Cameron, mm -hmm. but this suggests it came after my statement. So, because I remember, um, Gail, you had moved and I, yep. and I indicated I wouldn't support. So maybe we could yep. just put the, the motion right after the paragraph that starts with General Counsel Blue, if that's consistent. My memory isn't wrong. Okay. Good. Uh. Yeah. Makes sense. Any other uh, comments about the the minutes? Any edits? Very well done, as always. Yeah, very well done. I, uh, if it's any help, I um, I signed off on all the grants that we approved okay. on behalf of Derek, who's out, and I used the minutes to make sure very. That they were in accordance with what we voted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very in great shape. Really, really well done. Kudos to Shar. It's not yeah. really me burning the midnight oil. It's, <laughs> it's her good work. Thank you, Shar. Okay, so do we have a motion? Oh, I mean, was I it, you, it's, made it's, it. you made I, it second. You will have a second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Commissioner, oh, the legal division, my apologies, and we're now on <coughs> to uh, General Counsel Blue. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have four regulations before you today. They are in the final stage of promulgation. Um, I will lead off with the first one. I have Deputy General Counsel Grossman and other staff to come and speak to you about the balance of them. Um, so the first one is the uh, 205 CMR 6.35. This is the pick and pulls. And as you may recall, this adds an additional set of wagers to the racing regulations. Um, this provides more of a more product, as they say, to the, the uh, wagers at the track. We have had the public hearing on this regulation. We did not receive any other comments. So we believe it is ready to go to the final promulgation process. As you may recall, racing regulations are a little bit different. Once you approve them, we send them to the legislature where they have 60 days to provide any comments to us. And if they don't provide comments at that point, it becomes final. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the amended small business impact. Well, do that first. The, the amended small uh, business impact for 205 CMR. 6.35 picket pool included in the packet. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I, fur I further move that the commission approve the version of 205 CMR 6.35 pick and pools as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. The second regulation that we have is an amendment to 205 CMR 102.02. These are definitions, particularly the definitions pertaining to minority business enterprise and um, veterans business enterprise. And I have Jill Griffin here today who can explain to you the comment that we got. Um, we received um, feedback from Plain Ridge Park Casino, and um, Plain Ridge is interested in and has, has um, raised um, practices in other jurisdictions of Colorado, Missouri, Iowa, Ohio, Mississippi, and Nevada. In those gaming jurisdictions, um, they accept all all diversity certifications um, um, and affidavits from all states. Um, so they're suggesting that that um, could be an option for um, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to use. Additionally, they raise um, some 
MBE um, certifications, um, the National Minority Supplier Development Council, other state certifications that they suggest that we include in our definitions to make those definitions broader. I'm, however, recommending that we follow our state supplier diversity office um, procedures. Um, and that this is consistent with the practice that we did um, during construction, with the um, exception of an update up to the VBE um, category, because now our state supplier diversity office um, certifies um, VBEs. Yeah, I was interested, uh, and we, we did have a, a chance to discuss this previously uh, with Director Griffin, I did anyway, um, uh, with regard to um, two things. One, um, what were our concerns slash risks with using out-of-state documents? And I know you pointed out that um, uh, an important piece here in the Commonwealth is a, a site visit, to, and that really is an effective way to make sure there isn't fraudulent um, activity around this process. So that actually made a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was important to me that we were not being onerous or um, it, it wasn't uh, discouraging folks. But um, you, you did have a chance to explain that the, um, the, the in-state certification has really um, been streamlined um, and not onerous to those individuals, say from another state who may have a certification elsewhere, they can download it, that'll, um, you know, kind of save time in the process. So I, I thought that was an important piece too, the fact that we're asking you to do it here, but we paid attention to the process and, right. and it has been streamlined um, and uh, it, it isn't, in your opinion, overly onerous. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, that's accurate. And um, I actually had an additional conversation with the Supplier Diversity Office. Mm -hmm. um, they, they reiterated um, that there is great variety from state to state in terms of standards. Um, for example, New Jersey and New York don't do site visits. Um, and uh, that's where some of the fraud can come in. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, they raised that um, they are in the final stages of a um, memorandum of understanding with the, um, the National Lee Bank, the WBE certification entity. Um, so so um, folks who have that certification um, soon will have a very speedy process um, to, to get their certification through um, the supplier diversity office. Um, they're open to other um, arrangements as long as they have um, a working relationship with um, a certification entity and that entity has very strong um, standards and um, guidelines. So in the example of New York and New Jersey, if a business from New York, let's say, who has been certified by the agency there, wanted to use the streamlined process in Massachusetts and upload information, could they be certified by the SDO? So they cannot be certified by the SDO without a site visit. Um, so they would likely need to get certified um, not by their um, state entity that doesn't do the site visits, by, but perhaps by another entity maybe the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the um, um, WeBank entity or the um, equivalent of the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council. But without a site visit, our state will not certify. Um, and they, they raised, um, a, I asked um, for a rationale, um, they raised a, a recent um, situation that occurred. Um, they did give me permission without um, names of companies, of course, but in Massachusetts, a site visit that occurred, um, they were invest, you know, um, um, the certification investigator was meeting with um, the um, 
one of the um, WBE owners, a woman owner, she owns 51%, but you also need to uh, prove that you actually have control of the business. In this case, um, the um, woman was asked if she had a business card, and she said, no, I don't have a business card, and they said, um, the investigator noticed that the husband's business cards that indicated that he was present were right on the desk. So, you know, there are situations like that that they can uncover mm -hmm. with a site visit. Um, so. so they were married and she was listed as 51% owner and right. the husband was the president? So. It, in addition to, um, and I think most states have this requirement, in addition to owning 51% of the business, um, you need to show that you have um, um, control of the business and, and that you're actually involved in the business, mm -hmm. um, making decisions and so forth. I, I think that's the example that I would use to, to say why it's appropriate to amend it the way you're amending it and leave it to supplier to diversity office. It's their bailiwick in terms of when they think it's appropriate to have reciprocity and not. And I think site visits are a perfect example of why we wouldn't make exceptions like Penn is asking us to make and amend it the way you asked us to amend it. I, I agree with that and I, I think to do otherwise that, um, could really put our own um, WBEs and MBEs at a disadvantage because unless we could truly hold um, out-of-state vendors to the same um, expectations, for instance, Jill would be going and doing site visits, it would put um, a, a stronger onus on, on our own uh, businesses. It doesn't make sense. The, uh, you're quite right. My experience uh, um, working with OSD is extensive in their have been extensive uh, streamlining to make sure that vendors from out of state are given opportunities here. Uh, and, and yet also ensure the safeguards that you know, you've pointed out uh, in terms of the site visits, that is a way to make sure that in fact they are true, um, truly either women um, business enterprises or minority business enterprises that they do have the control yeah, I would, I would just add, you know, this is, it's um, important to remember this doesn't cost a vendor mm -hmm. anything. It is I mean, great. Massachusetts does provide this. Mm -hmm. I think we have a good mix of national certifications included so that if you aren't here in Massachusetts, you might have pursued certification through one of the national partners. Um, this also doesn't preclude any Massachusetts business from doing business with one of our licensees. It just doesn't allow them to be counted toward their minority women and veteran-owned goals until they get some type of certification. Mm -hmm. I think we're mindful of the integrity of this process and making sure that counts and data and you know stories of you know the good news stories we expect you know are uh, are valid. Um, and again, you know this might actually give an opportunity for our licensees to up some numbers. If one of the companies that they're currently doing business with doesn't have a certification, it allows them to start counting them. So, um, and again, you know, this was one of those specific pieces of 23K that talked about our licensees having plans to do businesses with minority women and veteran-owned companies. I mean, it was uh, it was that specific that I, I think it it's reflected in this level of specificity that we give some guidance as to what the true credential is to help us meet the goal. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, I read also the, um, the comments from Penn and I found them interesting. I, I don't suggest, I don't agree that we should be as uh, perhaps liberal as some of the states that they list and it's just simply accepting anybody else um, because there is that potential or that risk. But I, it did make me think of what does an additional certification may mean, however streamlined, in terms of poten potential barriers. So um, if somebody was certified elsewhere and we either came to know or the supplier diversity office came to know that that's a legitimate certification body because they do site visits and they do all these other things, 
that the way the current regulation stands is restrictive simply to be certified by the supply diversity office here. So um, I wonder if there is at least any kind of you know language that we could insert in terms of as maybe as determined by either us or the track record or some or allow for some kind of reciprocity with you know allowing that if we are comfortable that there is a body out there again after some period of record track record that there's somebody out there wherever they are because they're the greater new england um, council they certify people from all of new england for example um, the additional um, certification step that's embedded here just might i don't know that it will but just might serve as a barrier for somebody uh, getting certified so i i um i i think you know the fact that uh, my, my, the concern is greatly ameliorated by the fact that um, the, it doesn't cost to be certified, as you correctly point, uh, point out, uh, by the SDO. Uh, it can be, a lot of information can be uploaded, which is great that there's use of technology. But at least the idea that I think is um, salvageable in terms of, or, or worthy of, of, of um, considering from one of the comments is that of reciprocity. If there would be other um, bodies that we would be comfortable with uh, accepting their certification because there's either enough track record, enough familiarity, or enough um, comfort level with how they do things. I think the problem with that, though, is the, the people with the expertise to make the determination of the quote unquote if we're comfortable is really right. OSD right. and not us. And so I think the better way to do it is this, understanding they're moving toward things like a national we bank recognition and reciprocity and things like and, that. And wouldn't you want certification to go both ways? Right. Not just letting, you want Massachusetts companies to have the advantage of being you know, reciprocity in whatever other jurisdiction there is. Right. I, one of the things Jill and I have talked about is once this is formalized, thinking about a communication that could go out to everybody we already know is registered or licensed in our system, saying, be aware of this change, be aware, you know, here are the actual access points to do this. And I think to your point in the process that we've learned from OSD, if you currently hold a certification from another state, here is a process by which you can have that certification reviewed by OSD, again, ultimately leaving the decision making. But I think something that maybe spells out how somebody can work around, you know, uh, what might appear to be a barrier, uh, do it not necessarily through the regulation, but a, you know, the, the pretty thoughtful communication out to people, so that we don't leave people on the outside. They still have a process or aware of what they can do to become recognized by OSD. And again, just using information that they may have already provided their own home state. And, and I, again, uh, would emphasize to do otherwise would mean that for our Massachusetts companies, they would be subject to a more stringent review than what we might be requiring of out of state. Because they would have to be, unless we're going to waive certification processes for Massachusetts, um, where there's no reciprocity, obviously, because it's our state. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think it would probably, you know, create a level playing field. So uh, I think, you know, Commissioner O'Brien has said it. They are the, the experts. They have made, they work tirelessly to break down the barriers that I think that I understand that you, you know, may assume that are out there. The national uh, certification process is an excellent one where they're going to use, you know, enterprises that they trust to do a, uh, a, a, the thorough job that we expect. So if, uh, I would recommend that we actually rely on the state experts to create consistency in, in, um, for, for our licensees. I, I think it's a sound recommendation. I do. Madam Chair, are you ready for a motion? 
I am. <laughs> uh, so I move the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 10202 de definitions included uh, in the packet. Second. Second. Any further discussion? The only comment I would say is I um, we appreciate uh, Cambridge Park Casino weighing in and um, in mm -hmm. our public comment process. So we thank you for uh, PPC for that. Do I have um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. And I further move that the commission approve the version of 205 CMR 10202 definitions as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Moving on to 8C. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roseman will present on the amendments to 205 CMR 143.02. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Helwig and I were last before you a number of months ago recommending this particular amendment. Uh, it pertains to essentially the physical security of progressive gaming devices. Mr. Helwick could certainly explain uh, the technical components of this, but the lay version of it is that when we first uh, adopted this regulation, we did not account for the fact that a progressive gaming device could be integrated into the software of a slot machine. And we said essentially it has to be uh, behind lock and key in a number of areas. So what we set out to do based on a number of uh, inquiries that Mr. Helwig received from our licensees was to clarify this section to say that um, essentially it, a progressive controller is considered secure if it's either integrated into the software or it's housed um, in a dual key controlled environment, which we allowed previously or some alternative that someone brings to us that we deem to be equally secure. So that's the overview of the section. Essentially, as you uh, likely observed, this amends a section of GLI 12, which is the uniform standard the commission has adopted governing progressive uh, gaming devices in general, um, and just uh, modifies what they have in there at their direction. Todd, I just had a quick question down the bottom. It says, no controller may be accessed until written notice is provided to the commission. And then we say, no, whenever the progressive controller and or bank controller has been accessed, written notification shall be provided to the commission. I think that came from the last time. This was before us where I was concerned that not having the second sentence would not let us know if a breach happened. So it was putting the onus on them okay. that if yeah, something happened and they hadn't notified us that they had to immediately notify. And so I had asked them to amend the language accordingly. Okay. Never mind, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I should have gone to the source. Thank you. With that, um, if there are no further uh, questions, we would uh, request a uh, motion to adopt these changes and so we can finalize the promulgation process. Uh, Madam and Chair, I'd move the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 143.02 progressive gaming devices included in the packet. Second. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move the commission approve the version of 205 CMR 143.02 progressive gaming devices as included in the packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Now moving Thank you. On. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Scott. you, Scott. <laughs> um, moving on to 8-D. The final regulation before you today consists of amendments to 205 CMR 152. This is the excluded persons list. 
These amendments do a couple of things. They conform the hearing process that was originally in this section with our overall hearing pro process in 205 CMR 101. It also allows an appeal by both parties. If you remember initially, under the excluded persons list, only the party could appeal it, but the IEB could not appeal the hearing officer's decision, so now either party can appeal. And then finally, the, we've added language to allow the commission to revoke, uh, condition, or suspend the license of a licensee who does not take an excluded person out of the gaming establishment. I'm sorry, what was the last aspect? The last one gives the commission the ability to revoke, limit, condition, suspend, or oh, fine yeah. a gaming licensee if it knowingly or recklessly yes. fails. Yes, and it's um, paragraph six. Yeah. Are there any questions on this? For uh, uh, I'm, I'm sh I think that Councillor uh, Lilios may have briefed you on this in the past. She's out today, so thank you, Councillor mm -hmm. Blue. Any questions for Catherine? Okay, do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the amended small business impact <coughs> statement for 205-152, individuals excluded from gaming establishment included in the packet. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move the Commission approve the version of 205-CMR-152 individuals excluded from a gaming establishment as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Janice, you performed quite remarkable timing. Uh, we're just a little bit off, but the commissioner's updates. Uh, yep. I, um, along with Commissioner O'Brien, had a chance to meet with um, Sh Sheriff uh, Katujian this week, earlier this week. <coughs> he, the sheriff and his staff took the initiative of conducting a uh, problem gaming survey with um, with inmates at the facility, and um, uh, the sheriff uh, reached out to us to uh, collaborate, to share the information first, and then secondly, to um, talk about ways that we could collaborate with the research uh, that he has done. So I think we had a very um, interesting meeting. I know um, Director Vander Linden is not here now, but um, he discussed uh, a number of ways the collaboration could happen. The sheriff was very open to that, and um, I think it really could add to the research that we do. Um, we also had a chance to tour the facility and see the good work they're doing um, with uh, different units, new ideas here in the Commonwealth. So that was uh, that was nice to see. But in particular, the um, uh, the work around the uh, the gaming study, the gambling study, uh, was was important work, uh, initiative, you know, kind of a, a something that they took the, in, uh, the initiative to do, and um, so that was uh, that was a, a, a good meeting. Some of the staff members were here too. Mm -hmm. Commissioner O'Brien, anything to add? Just that the purpose of it was really get a baseline before Encore had opened, and yes. one of the things that um, we noted that I think Mark Vander Linden would follow up with um, Sheriff Katushin on is because we don't have online sports betting. Now is the perfect time to get the baseline of what sort of the illicit market and or the limited market is now and then see what, if any, impact it has because the, the type of money that might be required to go into Encore at this point might be a limiting factor on getting the impact that you might have anticipated on the population that's in mass correction in Middlesex, but that that might not be the same for sports betting, particularly if it goes online. And so Mark was gonna work with them to really try to get a baseline on that mm -hmm. with the understanding there's a real possibility that that would be coming in the near future. Mm -hmm. Did Mark say that there's some 
that the baseline study, the original uh, omnibus uh, baseline study, did address sports betting at all? Do we have any yeah. data on that? We do. Yeah, there's, there's behavior. We, we learn how, you know, the, the type of gambling um, modalities that people engage in, uh, including illegal and online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and at the general, uh, you know, it's, it's time, as, as I was talking earlier, to do the, the, the redo. Um, so but, uh, but yeah, we, we, we do have we some, have some, goodness, some information about think, that. And, and then, then yeah. targeting what is otherwise a yeah, vulnerable population is, to right. see so, if, particularly true. where the sheriffs come in, is there anything else they can do as on, part of right. rehabilitation on and incarceration this particular on that population. particular yeah. issue? Yes. And he's that looking at, sense. you know, what are the stressors, what are right. the causes sure. of reoffense and stuff like that. Right. You know, similar, but they, he has an independent purpose for it. But it would be interesting to know in a subpopulation like this if there's any correlation or not. Right. Yeah, no, this is, this is another one of those. Uh, a general population survey will not have enough inmates, if you will, or mm -hmm. former inmates for, for it to ascertain any kind of a real um, you know, understanding mm -hmm. of, of those subpopulations. But as community-driven research, as I was explaining, on targeted population, like the ch sheriff is doing, or like we could collaborate, could really go a long way towards understanding, you know, those those things or those idiosyncrasies that might be different from other other groups. Right. Because I know in New Jersey they did they produced some early stats, but uh, not with respect to that population, with respect to the disability community, with respect to minorities. Mm -hmm. So that would be really interesting. And so Mark is going to follow up on. Yes, he is. He was. Mm -hmm. He was actually most excited about this work. And, yeah. um, it's and and really, yeah, the sh the sheriff is um, is very very much um, committed to um, uh, data driven research analysis and then using that to Excellent. to tweak programs. Um, so this was a, a, a good initiative that I think we all found worthwhile. And, and to see him out in front. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and on that note, uh, Mar Marlene Warner has been, um, who is, the, as you know, the, um, the head of the executive director of the Mass Council on Compulsive Gambling, has uh, made comments into, has provided comments and has been telling us on the Public Health Trust Fund about the need to look at or the potential to look at people who have uh, gone through the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and uh, their levels of gambling, at risk gambling behavior and, and, and or whether it was their gambling that puts them into the uh, into uh, the, the criminal system. So there's there's really a, an area for us to collaborate, not just with entities like the sheriff and I'm, I'm really glad that they're being proactive in this sense, but there's other groups like the Mass Council uh, and you know and DPH who would be interested in uh, Understanding, you know, all of those uh, nexus. Any other? Any other updates? Do you want to update us on Europe? Oh, it was hot. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were jealous. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. 5-0. Thank you.